Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Ms Hogan Doran, good morning. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Let's provide a short overview. As we commence this fourth week of hearing block two, today's general overview is again intended to guide parties with leave to appear and to assist you, Commissioners, in your identification and consideration of relevant issues. Shorter overviews will be given at the start of hearing days to further frame the issues for consideration. As mentioned last week, the 2019-2020 Bushfire History Project is an initiative of this Royal Commission to record personal experiences of the 2019-2020 unprecedented bushfires and the ongoing recovery. The material received will form part of the official records of the Royal Commission. People are still welcome to contribute to the project and we are grateful for the many further contributions which were received in recent days. Last week's PowerPoint is available for download from the Hearing Block 2 section of the Royal Commission's website. Today, we propose to show you a further presentation of about 30 photographs and videos recently contributed by Australians as part of that project. The videos start with vision of kangaroos fleeing from fires on Kangaroo Island in South Australia to numerous ground and aerial fire suppression activities across New South Wales and ends with the footage of the devastation along the main street of Mogo on the New South Wales south coast and of the evacuation by holiday makers onto the beach near Lake Conjola, south of Sydney. Viewers are warned that they may find some content distressing.
Telling. Thank you, Ms. Hogendor. On Friday, Commissioners, we heard a range of perspectives from volunteer firefighter associations and select volunteer firefighters themselves. They demonstrated that experience is important. For that reason, this morning, the Royal Commission will now hear from a selection of former leaders of fire, rescue and emergency service agencies. In the afternoon, you will hear a range of perspectives from another group of stakeholders involved in the response phase of emergency management, forest firefighters. As Mr Glover mentioned on Friday, these voices are not the only word, or even the last word, the Commission will hear on this topic. This point presents an opportunity for me to further explain our approach to the content of the further hearings of the Royal Commission. First, to be clear, today's evidence is not limited to rural or country firefighting, nor is it restricted to the 2019-2020 bushfire season. Despite what may be said from time to time in correspondence to the Royal Commission and in media commentary, this is not the Bushfires Royal Commission, however convenient it is, of course, to refer to it in that shorthand manner. Commissioners, your terms of reference are far more wide-ranging and mandate an inquiry into all national natural disasters, not just bushfires and not just the 2019-2020 bushfire season. This is not an insignificant task. To this end, a very large amount of material has been provided to the Royal Commission by the states and territories in answers to far-reaching compulsory notices to give information. Of course, it has been necessary to issue such notices in order for the Commission to address the terms of, the reference, of reference in your letters patent. That material has now been collated and will be tendered during the course of this week. It is very, very substantial, numbering some 10,000 pages of written responses. I stress these are just the written responses to the questions sent by the Commission some months ago. The tender will not include all the numerous frameworks, policies and procedures also provided in answer to the Royal Commission's notices to produce documents. The written material from the states and territories is extensive, mostly comprehensive, and has been prepared, at least as we understand it, with the assistance of expert legal representation and other valuable resources that are available to such sophisticated parties granted leave to appear. The council assisting team is therefore confident that you need not feel obliged, commissioners, to receive oral evidence from all of the very many state and territory officers who could speak to the matters canvassed by those responses. Although, of course, some such officers have already been and will continue to be called to give oral evidence on particular matters. Our approach to the evidentiary process has been reinforced by the very short time frame that this Royal Commission was given by the Governor-General and each of the State and Territory Governors on the advice of their respective executive governments and with the added operational limitations which have since been imposed by the ongoing global pandemic. 
Commission is, as you know, one of the courses you have pursued is to direct the publication of several issues papers in an attempt to elicit insights and submissions on key topics arising from the terms of reference and to inform the conduct of the oral hearings. Although some states and territories have sought to assist you by responding to these invitations within the limited time period specified, others have not. It was the preference of the Council Assisting Team to have the benefit of relevant submissions on the most recent issues paper on firefighting equipment and personnel prior to calling as witnesses the volunteer firefighters on Friday. Nonetheless, Council Assisting support those states and territories which have not yet responded, having an opportunity to make a submission to that issues paper, as well as the evidence provided during last Friday's hearing. Council Assisting will tender the responses to the issues paper as soon as those responses from key stakeholders have been processed. To assist you in digesting this vast body of material, I will shortly tender a series of diagrams which have been confirmed by each of the states and territories' representatives as describing their organisational arrangements for emergency management. In addition to that diagram for each state and territory, a second diagram has been prepared um, and these will also be included in the tender. The second diagram is the Office of the Royal Commission's attempt to simplify and standardise the description of arrangements so that they can be more readily compared with each other. A glossary with a brief description of the roles and functions of the key agencies referred to in the diagrams is also to be included. During the course of today, I will also tender a further series of scenarios that have been provided to the states and territories under compulsory notice. These seek to explore how their emergency management sectors would operate during hypothetical future disasters, having learned the lessons of the 2019-2020 bushfire season, and in particular how and when they would seek interstate, commonwealth and international assistance to combat such emergencies in the future. We have deferred calling the current emergency agency leaders to speak to these issues until after the responses to the scenarios have been submitted to the Royal Commission. Responses to the scenarios must be submitted by next Monday, 13 July, although states and territories are encouraged to respond by the end of this week, if practicable, so that the responses can be circulated to other government parties with leave to appear, and so that there is no disruption to the timetable, which now envisages the current emergency leaders being called to give evidence commencing from Wednesday, 15 July. Those days of evidence will also provide state and territory emergency leaders a further opportunity to respond to any issue of concern raised by the evidence to date. State and territory governments may wish to provide witness statements to the Royal Commission addressing those topics in advance of next week's hearings. Returning then to this week's subject matter, tomorrow we will examine oversight and accountability frameworks for natural disaster management in Australia. Where a disaster occurs, the Australian public naturally seeks assurance that those in the disaster management sector did all they could to ensure the best outcome. We will ask, why wouldn't Australian governments want to provide better accountability, transparency and oversight of their natural disaster and emergency management sectors having regard to that public interest? We will canvass how an effective natural disaster management assurance framework has the potential to ensure greater accountability and transparency of the sector. We will explore how such a framework integrates with other natural disaster management functions and how it can result in improvements and greater efficiencies. Our witnesses are uniquely placed to speak to issues of oversight and accountability in the natural disaster management sector in Australia. You will hear from both the Victorian Inspector General of Emergency Management, the IGEM, Mr Tony Pearce, and the Queensland IGEM, Mr Alistair Dawson. <coughs> both IGEMs perform similar functions, and indeed their respective offices were established on the same day, but for different reasons. They work to provide assurance to government and the community regarding the disaster management frameworks in Victoria and in Queensland. Of some relevance to our examination on recovery and funding arrangements later this week, the Queensland IGEM has prepared a report on recovery governance arrangements that concludes that to be successful, first, there needs to be an empowered community with a community-led bottom-up approach to action and responsibility. Second, there needs to be leadership at a local level. And third, there is a very specific role for government to support and facilitate the local leadership and build community capacity and capability. 
I'll have more to say about Thursday and Friday's hearings shortly. Land use planning and the built environment are largely the responsibility of the states and territories. So on Wednesday, we will examine the extent to which natural hazard risk is incorporated into their decisions about where people live, how land is used, and the types of buildings that are constructed. You will hear evidence from a number of experts, peak bodies, and state and territory representatives. The following themes will be explored. First, accurate and relevant risk information is essential to inform land use and building design and construction. For example, Standards Australia have told the Royal Commission that the development of standards to support building in bushfire prone areas could be improved with the inclusion of relevant and accurate data. IAG has said that accurate hazard information is critical to understanding natural disaster risk and informing state and local land use planning. The Australian Business Roundtable for Disaster Resilience and Safer Communities note, has noted that without clear guidelines on what data is available and how it should be used, the ability of local governments to promote pre-disaster resilience through land use planning and development will be reduced, and that the ability of local governments to assess the safety of a particular development is limited by the quality and availability of information. The Property Council of Australia has said that a lack of national comprehensive data and mapping has undermined understanding of natural hazard risk by governments and the community. This has contributed to poor planning decisions leading to property development in areas of significant risk. The next proposition, natural hazard risk information is often insufficient or insufficiently integrated into land use planning schemes. The Insurance Council of Australia has said that although land use planning has improved in respect of, to reducing disaster risk reduction, there is still clear evidence of recent planning decisions placing communities at a known and obvious risk of disaster. Risk Frontiers argues that land use planning needs to be improved to reduce the chance that future developments are exposed to unreasonable risks, for example, acknowledging the increased risk of damage the closer a property is to bushland. An IAG says that with sound and consistent government controls, there is little to prevent ongoing building in locations of extreme vulnerability. Improved land use planning will involve a commitment by government to develop national land use planning criteria that prohibits inappropriate land use in Australia. Next proposition, the risks to existing structures and settlement areas which can change over time are not adequately addressed in land use planning regimes. For example, the National Parks Association of Australia says that a limitation of the statutory framework for assessing and approving development in New South Wales is that it only applies to those new developments that are seeking approval through the planning system. There is no requirement for pre-existing development to be retrofitted to provide increased resistance to bushfire. The Insurance Council of Australia notes that while newer buildings remain vulnerable to extreme weather, Older buildings are more susceptible to damage due to being constructed to a standard lower than that required by the present day building code, or becoming vulnerable as a result of wear and tear, pre-existing damage or general degradation. Therefore, measures targeting the quality of older buildings should focus on addressing these vulnerabilities. The Bega Valley Shire Council noted that the bushfire attack level experienced in the Bega Valley exceeded previous expectations, with fire affecting many properties that were not pre previously considered bushfire prone. The current bushfire prone land maps and bushfire attack levels do not consider the impacts of climate change on fire frequency and intensity. And finally, this proposition. An individual can be unaware of the risks to their properties and that the risks may change over time. The Financial Rights Legal Centre argues, consumers currently have limited access to natural hazard data in easily digestible formats and very little motivation to seek it out and use it. Consumers do not have the information that a local government or their insurer has to take appropriate steps to mitigate the natural hazard risks to which they are exposed. And finally, the Planning Institute of Australia has said that there is a need for mechanisms designed to ensure that bushfire safety continues to be a priority for building owners. On Thursday and Friday, you will hear from representatives of the states and territories concerning recovery and funding arrangements and suggestions for how these may be improved. Commissioners, as you may recall from my opening to the hearings on local government on 22 June, 
The Royal Commission has received a large number of submissions about the lived experience of obtaining recovery support, as well as submissions and responses to compulsory notices describing recovery issues from a local government perspective. There is a common desire from councils for additional support in the area of recovery. That said, not all accounts were negative. Midwestern Regional Council described the great support to recovery efforts it received from the newly established Resilience New South Wales and how useful this was for a local government area which had not experienced that level of impact from a natural disaster previously. Both the City of Gold Coast and Scenic Rim Regional Council in Queensland noted the value they see in having the Queensland Inspector General of Emergency Management assist in maintaining a disaster management standard and to identify best practice throughout the state. In his review of recovery arrangements in Queensland, which I earlier mentioned, the Queensland IGM found that the greatest opportunity for enhancing recovery was in improving the way in which recovery is perceived. For many at a local level, we gathered the impression of recovery as a poor cousin to response. From some at a state level, they heard uncertainty or disinterest about roles in recovery. The iGEM saw an opportunity to change the culture about recovery, to kindle the determination to make this long, complex and emotionally charged stage of disaster management work even better. The disaster recovery funding arrangements is dependent on the states and territories and the arrangements that they have in place. This can result in inconsistency in the delivery of recovery assistance across jurisdictions and delays in processing claims by local governments. It can also result in perceptions that recovery assistance will only be provided if a state or territory government is willing to co-fund costs for a particular disaster event. We note that on the 13th of March this year, the Council of Australian Governments agreed to review how the disaster recovery funding arrangements is applied with a view to streamlining processes where possible and to provide for betterment activities. As to the first matter, a desire to streamline processes emerged in the submissions of local government to this Royal Commission, with some raising concerns that multiple agencies are involved in assessment for funding claims at state levels, leading to delays in payment distributions. Inconsistencies can also arise where state program delivery arrangements do not allow for some program components to be implemented. There is also limited flexibility in the recovery services and expenditure that the DRFA covers and how funding is accessed. This extends to primarily providing funding on a reimbursement basis across all categories, which it is said negatively impacts smaller organisations with limited financial capacity, and reconstruction of essential public assets only, except where agreed under Category C or Category D, and limited services which it covers as, for example, legal assistance services to individual and businesses and environmental recovery. As to the second matter identified by COAG, the disaster recovery funding arrangements only allows reconstruction of assets to, a pre, to its pre-disaster condition or to meet current standards. Under Category B, noting that where a reconstruction project comes in under budget, the savings can be used for mitigation projects. Betterment is only provided through Category D, but it appears that this has only been available to Queensland in four disaster events. <coughs> that brings me back to today. One way to inform and shape the future is to examine what has happened in the past. In the Australian context, this must be with a recognition of a changing climate and the increased risks posed by natural disasters in the future. You will hear shortly from five former commissioners of fire and emergency services organisations of the states and territories. First, you will hear from Major General Peter Dunn, AO, retired, a former commissioner of the ACT Emergency Services Authority. Then Mr Greg Mullins, AO, AFSM, a former Commissioner of Fire and Rescue New South Wales. They will take us to morning tea. After morning tea, we will hear from Dr, Grain, Dr. Wayne Gregson, APM, OAM, a former Commissioner of the Western Australian Department of Fire and Emergency Services, and Mr Lee Johnson, AFSM, former Commissioner of the Queensland Department of Fire and Rescue Service. We anticipate that their experience in emergency management will assist the Commission with respect to coordination arrangements and interoperability. As you will see, it is a testament to the emergency services community that even after their tenures, these individuals remain actively engaged in emergency services and disaster recovery, as you will hear during their examinations today. 
After lunch, you will hear from Mr Ewan Waller, AFSM, and Mr Gary Morgan, AO, AFSM, both of whom are former Chief Fire Officers of the Victorian Department of Sustainability and Environment. They will now give their evidence concurrently. Their evidence will also lead into the final evidence of the afternoon, being a forest industry panel on the role of forestry fire brigades. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Thank you. Ms uh, Spees will deal with the tender of material. Ms Spees. <coughs> Commissioners, I will first tender um, the diagrams that Ms Hogan Doran referred to, which are the diagrams of the organisational arrangements for emergency management. Um, those diagrams are um, exhibits 17.3 through 17.10 in the supplementary tender list, um, which has been available, made available to parties with leave to appear. And we'll take those diagrams as marked as exhibits. And I'll also uh, tender um, documents in the bundle 17.2 of the amended tender list. Uh, which are the uh, two submissions of Major General Peter Dunn and the response uh, of Major General Peter Dunn provided to the local government issues paper. Well, we'll take those as exhibits as well. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, the first witness to be called today um, will be Major General Peter Dunn, who is a former Commissioner of the ACT Emergency Services Authority. He is also the Vice President of the Condola Community Recovery Association. Uh, I call Major General Peter Dunn. Major General Dunn, good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Good to see you in a suit. Uh, special occasion, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Major General will be taking an affirmation this morning. Major General Dunn. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr Dunn, you've provided two submissions to the Commission on behalf of the Condola Community Recovery Association uh, and one response to the local government issues paper. Is that correct? Uh, the, the submissions were from my position in the association, but with personal submissions, and uh, then uh, the subsequent information was provided uh, from the association. Thank you. And, and do you adopt those as true and correct? I do. Thank you. Um, I'd like to um, cover two topics with you today. The first is in relation to your role as the Commissioner of the ACT Emergency Services Authority. Um, and then secondly, I will turn to your more recent experience at Lake Conjola during the 2019-2020 bushfires. Um, I understand that you were Commissioner of the ACT Emergency Services Authority from 2003 to 2007 um, when you retired from that role, is that correct? Uh, Mid-2006, I retired. Thank you. And since that time, have you remained involved in crisis management? I have been a consultancy basis, uh, particularly working in crisis management advisory, but also working with overseas aid and development operations in response to major natural disasters overseas. And uh, what types of advisory work um, have you done and for which bodies? Uh, in particular, I was working for the then AusAid in the uh, preparation of members of the uh, Australian Civilian Corps, which was a group of 500 people that were developed uh, post the 2007 elections, uh, federal elections. These people were uh, senior personnel who were uh, destined to go and lead recovery operations post disasters overseas or indeed to work on international development programs as well. Uh, it was both uh, post-conflict and post-natural disaster type deployments. Since then, I've uh, also uh, done a number of lessons learned activities, as they're known, uh, where uh, we've been involved in reviewing data and uh, with consultant companies and making recommendations to either uh, private organisations or governments on how uh, operations might be better uh, planned and prepared uh, to meet future contingencies. 
2018, I produced a short handbook uh, on preparing, uh, entitled Preparing to Lead in a Crisis, uh, which is a collation of the major lessons that uh, we found uh, had been learnt time and time again uh, over more than a decade, uh, looking at many uh, disaster responses, looking at uh, when things went wrong, uh, were there common features in that. Uh, and there were, so we've published that. I've published that. And that lessons learned um, assessment, was that in relation to Australian disasters or overseas or both? Uh, mainly Australian disasters, but uh, also took the opportunity to look into responses overseas to such things as the Ebola crisis in West Africa, as an example. Thank you. I'll um, now turn to uh, your role as Commissioner of the ACT Emergency Services Authority. Uh, when did you... You started in that role in 2003, and I understand that was after the Canberra bushfires. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, what was the... Uh, what was your role in, in general terms, and was it an all-hazards all role? Uh, very definitely an all-hazards role, uh, but the uh, inquiry, the post, uh, the operational response inquiry, which was conducted immediately after the 2003 fires, uh, recommended that uh, consideration be given to, given to setting up a statutory authority uh, in order to uh, better respond to disasters of the type that hit Canberra in 2003. The coronial inquiry that ran for some time thereafter uh, also made similar uh, commentary and it was decided that <clears throat> a statutory authority would be established and that would report direct to the minister. I reported then uh, to that minister that my task was to actually create that statutory authority uh, to work uh, in the establishment of new legislation and uh, then to build the authority into the structures that have been recommended uh, given the lessons that were learned in that major disaster in 2003. We Thank created you. a new organisation and rebuilt the uh, emergency services that were in it. Thank you. I'd like to bring up a diagram now, which is the ACT Emergency Services um, Organisational Diagram. That document uh, operator is RCN.900.052.0001. It's, it's quite a small diagram. We might just zoom in a little bit um, into the top section. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Major General, where did... Um, I understand that the, the current structure is different to uh, what it looked like when you were um, ACT Emergency Services Commissioner. Is that correct? That's right. The key element uh, that has changed is that the Emergency Services Agency, as it now is, uh, has reverted to being positioned under... Uh, the Head of Justice and Community Safety, the public servant that heads that. And, of course, uh, the uh, ESA, as it's known, is now an agency, not a statutory authority. Uh, a key recommendation post the 2003 fires was that uh, the emergency services uh, were to be a standalone statutory authority and report direct to the minister. Uh, the reason for this was, uh, in part, to allow the minister... Uh, to uh, become very familiar with the language, nuances, uh, techniques, tactics and capabilities of the emergency services organisations that were within the authority and would therefore better be able to direct their activities in a major emergency. It took out a layer uh, of uh, bureaucracy that uh, now exists yet again uh, within the ACT between the Minister and the Emergency Services. Thank you. Um, when you commenced uh, in your role as Emergency Services Commissioner, were the ACT um, emergency response systems and equipment and communications interoperable uh, within the ACT and with the New South Wales systems and equipment? 
Oh, there's a fair degree of interoperability within the ACT, but they were not necessarily interoperable with New South Wales, and the ACT was an island with its own communication system within New South Wales. So there were interoperability issues, and of course, uh, the interoperability also turns to training as well, and training of the uh, more senior people in the organisation. And during your time as an ACT Emergency Services Commissioner, uh, did that change? Yes, it did. The uh, communications were one of the first issues that were tackled in the creation of the new statutory authority, and uh, that was because of the interop interoperability issues that had uh, uh, become evident during the disaster in, two in January 2003. Uh, the end result was that we brought the New South Wales communications system uh, into the ACT. And it, it operated as a, a separate entity within New South Wales, but using exactly the same equipment. And uh, that then gave us reliability, availability and maintainability. And uh, we made that transition very quickly and very efficiently. And that removed the communications issue. It did not remove the training issue. Uh, because, again, there was a legacy of people doing their own thing uh, within their own jurisdiction, that is, uh, and that took much longer to change. That's a change management issue in relation to people. But the technical change was made very quickly and then removed the issue that was such a problem during the fire response. And why was... Um, uh, sorry, I... I'll withdraw that. In, in relation to the training, is, is that in reference to training in, in using the New South Wales systems? No, it's overall training. Uh, there is no national uh, training institution for fire, senior fire service officers and uh, therefore you naturally grow up uh, within the framework of your state or territory and uh, that uh, does produce uh, a barrier to interoperability. In the case of radio communications, the equipment change was easy. The people change, changing the mindsets, uh, was a somewhat more difficult proposition. In terms of changing the equipment over, um, how long do you estimate, estimate it took you um, to make that change? We did that within a year, and uh, we did it... Uh, uh, we're at, at a much reduced budget. Uh, we did a, a massive budget saving on that. But that, again, comes back to the fact that we selected uh, what was a very efficient system that was operating in New South Wales, and we chose to bring that into our small island, and that was a, a relatively simple technical task. Uh, there was resistance, though, because a lot of people had invested goodwill and energy in developing and maintaining the system that did exist in the ACT. Uh, those people naturally felt reluctant to uh, just walk away from that and bring in something from New South Wales. So we had to work very, very actively with those folks to say it was not that they'd done anything wrong, uh, but rather for the community's sake, we needed to have interoperability and we were going to bring in the system that existed all around the ACT. Uh, it was a no-brainer to do that, uh, but nonetheless, the people had to be managed carefully and sensitively because they had devoted a lot of effort and energy into doing the best that they possibly could with the system they had. The fact was they were not interoperable, and we made interoperability the prerequisite and uh, worked from there. But the technical changeover was relatively easy. It was a people issue, and as I said, turns to training, and each state and territory operates totally independently in that training area, particularly in their officer uh, ranks, and uh, we had to spend a lot of time uh, making sure that we uh, had a single view. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that the, the ACT was a, a small island in, within New South Wales. Um, what barriers do you see to making a similar change to achieve interoperability nationally? Uh, the, the, the question of uh, mindsets. Uh, I don't think you'd find a single firefighter uh, or emergency uh, service responder who wouldn't agree that we need to have interoperability 
but then you have to train that from uh, the top down. And uh, interoperability is not just uh, about communications or hose couplings. It, it's about the way we think and it's about the way uh, people go about their business. Uh, for example, when a, uh, a superintendent uh, appears uh, from interstate, you need to know that that superintendent is as well qualified as, they say, a superintendent from the state that you represent. Uh, but they do different things, so you have to go through a period of finding that out. In relation to communications, uh, then the same thing applies. Uh, we need to make sure that everyone understands the capabilities that are coming in. There are many good systems uh, that are in operation uh, around the country. Uh, it is a question of selecting a system that is uh, probably the best, selecting an existing system and uh, moving that to the other services. So uh, there will be uh, technical issues, there are obvious cost issues, but the biggest issue will be people's resistance because they've worked so hard to build the best system they can in their state. Thank you, Mr Dunn. Um, commissioners, I was going to um, move uh, to the question of um, uh, to a separate question, but if commissioners, if you had any questions in relation to interoperability before I move on, I think we'll just progress. We'll have a couple of questions for Major General Dunn uh, towards the end. Thank you. Again, more on information and uh, and the like. Um, in your submission to the commission, Major General, you recommended that when a state of emergency is declared, um, a controller at a local government level be appointed. I wonder if you could um, explain explain that um, and, and why you've recommended that. Yeah, I, I think uh, in, in a lot of what I've been uh, reading and watching as uh, the Royal Commission has progressed and also the New South Wales Independent Inquiry into bushfires, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing as much recognition of the massive effort that local government has to go simply go to simply to restore its own services uh, after a disaster of the size that we have here. Climate change has put us in the position where we have uh, an impact over entire local government areas and in the black summer recently it's over the entire country. A local government has to restore the roads and uh, has to get its own viability back with looking at uh, revenue and in particular it has to restore waste services. These are actually massive tasks and uh, we do see local government areas uh, understandably uh, struggling to return these services to the communities that they represent. Now, somebody needs to, I believe, uh, be in a position in those local government agencies, uh, local government areas, I should say, uh, to actually exert a very serious direction and coordination of the resources. And uh, the people that uh, I would envisage fulfilling that role in local governments would be ones who had to have training, uh, particularly in preparation and recovery. Uh, the response will come from the response agencies, but preparation and recovery is something that uh, definitely needs to be considered. Uh, and once we are in the recovery phase, very serious decisions have to be taken over the allocation of local government area resources. Um, I do believe the local governments uh, have been so stressed in returning basic services to the community that they have not been able to undertake the other tasks, such as supporting community-led recovery organisations, uh, and they need somebody uh, appointed to assist them in allocating the priorities in their uh, recovery themselves. They have to recover themselves uh, in order to provide the services to the community. Uh, moving um, to uh, community-led recovery, um, I, I understand that uh, um, you are involved in the community-led recovery in Conjola as the Vice President of the Conjola Community Recovery Association? I am now a, a humble committee member <laughs> and no longer the Vice President um, as, as we uh, move into the rebuilding phase. But I, uh, yes, uh, I started off as the coordinator, one of the two coordinators, and uh, then was Vice President. I'm now a humble committee member. Uh, this morning, the Commission uh, saw a video of the evacuation um, at 
Lake Conjola on the beach. Um, I understand that you live at Lake Conjola and you personally experienced um, the bushfires um, in that last bushfire season. Uh, can you describe for the Commission um, your personal experience with that evacuation? Uh, the evacuation was totally unplanned and it was chaotic. Um, and uh, what I can say is that uh, we were very, very lucky uh, that uh, there were not a lot more injuries, indeed deaths, uh, occasioned during that evacuation. Uh, the uh, preparations for the evacuation were, were essentially non-existent. And uh, it was a question of people literally throwing themselves into Lake Conjola. Uh, some quick thinking people organised power boats and jet skis to go west up to the uh, western end of the lake where the biggest impact was at a place known as Conjola Park and uh, ferry people uh, down to the beach. I had great difficulty in doing that because uh, of uh, shoaling in the river. Uh, the river, uh, sorry, the lake, I should say, the, the lake mouth uh, has been a, a, a contentious issue and that it is not navigable at the moment down to the beach. But everyone uh, fled to the beach once they reached the position where they could defend no more and uh, were there for many hours and uh, were literally on their own. The people that uh, evacuated included uh, thousands of campers. There are three very large camping areas in the Conjola area. Some 5,000 uh, tourist campers were there, uh, many with young families, the majority with young families, I'll probably say, and uh, they uh, were terrified. The uh, temperatures were high, the smoke was intense, uh, the noise was intense, and of course, whilst everyone was trying to evacuate down through the lake, uh, helicopter water bombers were trying to uh, fill their buckets in that same lake. It was an extremely dangerous situation, uh, extremely frightening for many, many people that have not experienced anything like this before, and one that will uh, or has affected, I know from talking to these people, um, affected many tourists' mental health, uh, let alone the people that actually lived in the Conjola area. So uh, there was a uh, safer place designated, that's the Lake Conjola Community Centre. Uh, that uh, is not a satisfactory place, that had not been prepared, uh, and indeed the surrounds caught fire uh, during the firestorms that struck the whole area. And uh, that uh, had to be saved, fortunately it was, uh, and it was certainly not used as a safer place. So I'd summarise it by saying that uh, it was uh, a, a chaotic evacuation. Uh, we were very lucky that uh, there were not more injuries during that evacuation. And uh, the uh, impact on people's mental health and uh, uh, overall wellbeing, uh, because of a lack of any preparation or any facilities, uh, evacuation assembly points, or reception areas or anything of that nature uh, has had a lasting impact on the community. Thank you. A bad impact. You have um, provided a number of photographs to the Commission. If I could ask for photograph RCN.900.038.0020 uh, to be brought up, please. Uh, this is a, a photograph that was tendered last week. Um, is this of the um, evacuation at the beach at Lake Conjola? That's at the beach of Lake Conjola, looking away from the fires uh, to, toward the beach. And uh, you will see that there are uh, jet skis and uh, fishing boats there in that uh, the left-hand uh, foreground. Uh, those uh, were being used to ferry people uh, down from areas up lake uh, to the beach itself. Uh, the beach became a lot more smoky and a lot crowded uh, a little bit after this shot. And uh, what's not in scene is the, the number of boats that are stranded on the uh, shoaling uh, in the lake mouth, as the lake mouth was closed to the beach. Thank you. Um, the Conjola Community Recovery Association, is that a community-led recovery group? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it uh, had to form into 
an incorporated association in order to manage uh, a large number of donations that were given specifically for the, uh, the, the either the people of, uh, of the Conjola area uh, or more of, in a larger amount uh, for the development of improved infrastructure, including evacuation infrastructure uh, for the overall community after the fires. And we're in the business of... Uh, uh, working with uh, the Shoalhaven Council in developing plans, master plans, uh, for that uh, very activity right now. But community-led, absolutely. The community uh, of uh, the Conjola area was effectively isolated for eight days after the fires impacted. And uh, because of uh, issues with putrefying garbage, uh, sewerage uh, being... Uh, reaching an overflowing stage, uh, well-being of people, provision of food and clothing. Uh, the community uh, were gathered together by a, a resident from Kajola Park. Uh, she uh, actually uh, asked people to gather at the community hall, uh, which they did. This was about three or four days after the main impact of the fires uh, and after the fires also reignited on the 4th of January and said, there's clearly no one coming. And uh, Miss Kim Harper is her name, uh, who is now the president of the association. Uh, Miss Harper recognized that uh, we had to do something ourselves. So we formed ourselves uh, into a recovery organization and uh, both myself and my wife were asked to coordinate that recovery. Subsequently, we formed the association. But uh, for the first month or so, we ran as a team of volunteers. You mentioned um, that the association was formed into an incorporated association um, in order to manage donations. Your submission um, refers to some of the complexities of setting up community recovery groups. Um, could you speak to that and um, how that complexity might be improved to assist community-led recovery groups? Yeah, look, it's uh, an, an extremely difficult task when you've had such a massive disaster and huge impact into the area where we had uh, three people killed, numerous other people injured, uh, but uh, some uh, 89 homes in one area uh, destroyed. But overall, uh, we found ourselves, or we find ourselves, because we're still doing this on a seven-day-a-week basis, looking after some uh, 131 uh, homes or families uh, that have either lost their home entirely or the home uh, has been deemed uninhabitable. And that's the situation where we're in six months after the event still. Um, there is a huge amount of community support that must be done. And the fact is that it is the community uh, that know who needs that support. Uh, the uh, Shoalhaven, the, cent the centre for the Shoalhaven Council is in Nara, some uh, 45 minutes to the north of Conjola and uh, no one could expect people in that organisation to know the community uh, as well as the local community itself. Uh, given that we had no choice because we were isolated for eight days, uh, we very quickly determined where that help was needed and uh, set about uh, doing that with a, a large team of volunteers. The community came together very, very quickly uh, but, of course, this work has now extended to the six-month period and shows no sign of abating. What's needed is really good support to come in behind the volunteers to support them and then to take over when it is suitable to do so. We are now seeing uh, organisations such as Red Cross deploy paid, qualified and very competent staff uh, into our area, and they are extremely welcome. Uh, there are case management organisations setting up uh, that will take over from what the volunteers uh, are doing. They are very welcome. Uh, we did have throughout uh, outstanding support from New South Wales health, mental health teams, uh, but that needs to pack in even more uh, behind the recovery that's going on at the moment. And of course, I mentioned the uh, large number, tens of thousands of dollars in the event uh, of donations that were specifically given to uh, us uh, and uh, uh, clear directions that they were to stay uh, in this local community, hence necessitating the setting up uh, of uh, the charitable fund uh, and uh, other processes around that. 
All of this suddenly means that a group of volunteers is in business. And we need uh, any of the recoveries, and I've spoken to many up and down the coast, we're in, we're in close connection now, we need uh, to have uh, a uh, support person or persons move into the community to help the volunteers. Not to take over from the volunteers, but to help for the volunteers and also to give guidance to the volunteers uh, as to what should be done with the funds. What's the best way to manage the organisation? How do you manage disputes within the organisation? Because there are tensions there. It's not sweetness and light just helping everybody. And given that everybody uh, who is volunteering, bar one or two, uh, have been in this disaster themselves, they too have suffered a degree of trauma. So it seems to us that the most simple thing to do immediately is in future uh, plan for state level, uh, perhaps New South Wales resilience in our case, in New South Wales officers to come in and work to support those community led volunteers. Uh, they will always be there. They will be the first point of call. The volunteers will know where to apply that assistance, uh, but they definitely need support to do so. We are seeing such large scale events that communities now are key to both uh, the preparation, some of the response and the recovery. And those communities need now to be directly supported. That's a fact of climate change. Uh, they are extreme events large scale uh, in terms of area and we need uh, some form of I believe nationally uh, designed uh, and then delivered through the states probably and territories uh, support by way of full-time personnel. Thank you. Um, you've also referred in your uh, submission to the impact of the loss of telecommunications on the community and the way in which that was restored. Are you able to uh, please describe that to the commissioners? Yes, the uh, loss of communications uh, obviously is uh, a major blow to any, any community and uh, it was total in our case. And uh, we was only connected to the outside world by listening to ABC. Uh, when they were conducting their emergency broadcasts, which they did exceptionally well, and to uh, the local commercial radio station 2ST. Uh, but the ABC was on constant emergency broadcast. But uh, after one or two days, when you are listening and can't respond to uh, the radio broadcasts, uh, it, it starts to become quite unnerving sitting there for some uh, 45 minutes each time listening to the roll through of uh, what was happening outside. All of the apps, of course, were useless, it could not be used. Uh, and any reference to the uh, far, uh, look at fires near me or look at traffic live, um, it was met with uh, some derision after about day two, given that no one could get those apps up. So, uh, if I could just pause it, you there, um, w was that because uh, because of the absence of telecommunications that those apps? No, because of, because of telecommunications, we had no internet access because the mobile towers went down, uh, and, and uh, it took an extremely long time to come back. Uh, they were they were severely damaged in our area. The solution uh, arrived in the form of the NBN who uh, arrived without notice uh, and literally said, uh, what can we do to help? And uh, established a satellite link. Firstly, through what they call uh, Muster Truck, using the Sky Muster satellite that they have. Uh, this mobile vehicle arrived. Uh, that provided uh, support to the recovery volunteer team, uh, but also to the community. Uh, we had a quick discussion and uh, literally within about 48 hours, NBN had provided uh, and, and, and installed with our help uh, a satellite dish on the community centre, which had opened up as the uh, recovery support centre uh, and uh, provided internal Wi-Fi for the recovery team to use so the computers could be used again and uh, also public Wi-Fi for the community to upload information or to talk on the internet uh, to be able to tell their loved ones, family and friends that they were still okay. Uh, 
uh, this became an absolute lifesaver and uh, the MDN Co must be complimented for the work that they did. Uh, and uh, that system is still in place in Conjola at the moment, and they provided a redundant system uh, at the bowling club in case things went down. Now, uh, that gave us a satellite link, which uh, we'd previously been unable to have, even as local consumers, because the uh, link into the NBN is by fixed wireless in our area. Now, there needs to be the opportunity for a satellite link uh, to various uh, centres, RFS, brigades, uh, SES uh, headquarters and the like provided all over this country but to allow communications to jump over natural disasters. We had outstanding communications after about two weeks and uh, that was literally a lifesaver on occasions. So uh, that is something that I believe uh, is an exemplar that is the, the work that NBNCO did, is an exemplar of what we can do very cheaply, very quickly, and produce a very effective emergency communications system. Uh, thank you, Major General. Commissioners, do you have any questions um, for Major General Dunn? Just um, appreciate the, the time. Just one question for the, for the Major General, and it goes back to the information uh, side of it. And uh, it's become quite apparent to the Commission, uh, timely decisions require timely and accurate inf information uh, there. Can I just go to the Major General's own submission? I just want to put that Fires Near Me app picture up, which is uh, nnd.001.00363. Dot zero one underscore triple zero three, and it's really just to uh, put this up. And, uh, and I understand, uh, Major General Dunn, there there has been issue, and and you allude to it about back burning and uh, and the, the like not being factored in. But also note that this is uh, this is the thirty first of December, the the fire spread prediction. Uh, there and we get to a situation where it didn't all happen overnight. But I'm just interested in the, the couple of days leading up up to this about uh, local government involvement and uh, what might have happened from state government or whatever about evacuation plans or updating uh, the evacuation centre or any plans that might or might not have been in in, in place. If you could just talk to to from a community perspective being there and looking at this develop, please? Uh, from the Conjola community uh, perspective, we've been watching the Karawan fire, as it was now uh, advanced from uh, the south uh, since the 26th of November. And we've been uh, frequently comparing what was on the app uh, with what happened on the ground. So we actually had a fairly uh, high degree of confidence in what it was showing us. Uh, for reasons that are being investigated at the moment uh, and possibly to do with which weather station was chosen uh, for the development of this map uh, that we see, uh, the app in which there was a lot of faith uh, did not show the, the fire spread coming across the highway. Uh, a number of us who had some experience said that was highly unlikely because strong westerly winds were predicted now, the impact of that was that people were not thinking in terms of evacuation. There was no evacuation preparation within uh, the Conjola Park, Lake Conjola, uh, Fisherman's Paradise area. People had paired their homes. Uh, they were uh, well and truly uh, down the path of uh, cleaning up around their homes, making sure they had the hoses in the right places, uh, collecting valuable items and the like. But uh, on uh, the 30th of December, uh, there was a sigh of relief that it would appear that the fire was not going to come to the east of the highway. So further evacuation within our community was not planned. Now, in the event, the, the, the highway was uh, cut anyway, so there needed to be community evacuation plans uh, as opposed to the overall decision. Yes, we'll have a, an evacuation centre at uh, Ulladulla. Uh, that's good, uh, but very few people get to it. Uh, so there are the two levels of planning that need to be undertaken, and we don't believe that was carried out uh, in this case. 
Uh, thank you very much for that. I appreciate uh, your insight into that. Commissioner Bennett, Commissioner McIntosh? No. I no. I think. Uh, do you have any more questions, Mr. Uh, no, Commissioners, I don't. Um, if Mr. If Major General Dunn could be released from his summons. OK, Major General Dunn, a couple of things. I appreciate the insight that you've given us this morning. You've given us a lot. Uh, and uh, and some a lot of lessons that have been identified there, and we appreciate that. We also appreciate it makes you relive six months on uh, some pretty traumatic uh, events that you were uh, you were a part of. Uh, but again, I appreciate you uh, being able to give that insight. And can, uh, on behalf of the commission, can I personally thank you, your wife, and the recovery uh, community recovery group that came together after the fires to uh, to support the community. I think. It, Excellent effort from uh, from everyone uh, involved. And if you could please pass on our thanks to them as well. I'll be very pleased to do so, Chair. Thank you. And Major General Dunn, you can be released from your summons. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, um, Mr Glover will be taking the next witness, Mr Greg Mullins. Mr Glover. Uh, commissioners, I call Greg Mullins. Mr. Um, Mullins, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Mullins will take an affirmation. Associate, could you please administer the affirmation? Mr. Mullins, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr Mullins, you were the Commissioner of Fire and Rescue New South Wales from 2003 to 2017, is that right? That's correct. And before that, you were the Assistant Commissioner from 1996 to 2000 and the Director State Operations from 2000 to 2003, is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. And so the effect of those... Uh, positions means that you coordinated all major bushfire operations for fire and rescue New South Wales from 1997 to 2017. Uh, yes, a little bit of your audio dropped out, but um, I think the question was I coordinated activities. So it was basically 96 to 2017, I coordinated all bushfire activities. Excellent. Thank you. That was my question exactly. Um, can you just um, describe for the uh, benefit of the Commission, what is the role of Fire and Rescue New South Wales? Sure. Um, now, now, Fire and Rescue New South Wales is one of the combat agencies in emergency management in New South Wales. They so have State Emergency Service, Rural Fire Service, Police Ambulance and Fire and Rescue. Um, they look at Fire and Rescue New South Wales looks after fire districts established under its Act, which are essentially all urban areas in New South Wales, um, 186 towns and cities throughout the state, including, um, of course, Sydney, where there's around 100 fire stations, Newcastle and Wollongong, Central Coast, but also small towns um, throughout the state provide a full range of emergency services, supporting the SES in some communities, um, doing medical first response with ambulance, but urban fire, bushfire, hazardous materials and road accident rescue. Um, so, and in bushfires, the particular role of Fire and Rescue New South Wales is the urban bushland interface. So it's one of, um, bushfires is actually one of the largest roles for the organisation. Uh, thank you. Now, you retired from the role as Commissioner in 2017. I just want to ask you about what you've been doing since then. Um, and one of the things you have been doing is that you've returned to your role as a volunteer firefighter with the Rural Fire Service. Is that right? 
Yes, that's correct. Um, I, as soon as I, well, before I retired, actually, I returned to the Rural Fire Brigade where I started fighting fires in the early 1970s with my father, who was a long-term volunteer. Um, so over the last few years, I've been fighting a lot of fires, particularly the last season. I'm currently a, a deputy group captain in the Rural Fire Service on the, in the Northern Beaches District. Thank you. Whereabouts did you deploy to in the most recent fire season? Um, lots of different locations. Um, casino in the north of New South Wales, the House, House Valley, um, the Gospers Mountain Fire, um, Wollumbi, Blackheath in the Blue Mountains, Bargo and southwest of Sydney, um, Batemans Bay, on New Year's Eve, um, Kringai Chase National Park in the local area. Uh, it, look, there's probably some others that I've missed, but um, lots of deployments. Thank you. And um, apart from your role as a volunteer firefighter, uh, you also authored the Northern Territory Review of Bushfires in 2018, a review of the Northern Territory Fire and Emergency Services in 2017, and a review of Queensland's government wireless network in 2018. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. I was um, asked to do a number of reviews by different state and territory governments. Thank you. Um, now, as you know, Mr Mullins, this Royal Commission is looking at national coordination arrangements in relation to natural disasters. I would like to ask you some questions about the history of the Australasian Fire and Emergency Service Authorities Council, or AFAC as it's known. Um, I would like you to answer, based on your experience of AFAC, and so please put your experience of New South Wales's arrangements to one side and consider the national perspective, please. Uh, you were Deputy Chair of AFAC from 2010 to 2013 and then AFAC's President from 2013 to 2016, is that right? Um, can you please describe your understanding of how AFAC came to be, that is, its origins and background? Uh, uh, yes, look, unfortunately, the, the audio is not the best, but uh, um, so I think you're asking about the history of AFAC. It was formed in 1993. Now, um, it was a bringing together of... There were three separate arms to AFAC. There was the rural fire authorities who had their own association, the urban fire services who had their own group, and the forest fire managers, which um, were basically forestry and national parks and uh, forest fire management group. Now, they coalesced in 1993. Approaches the national issues from those three bodies, but... Since then, it's been a, a very successful organisation. Later, State Emergency Services also joined AFAC. I think that was uh, probably around 2011 or 12. And are you able to assist the Commission in um, describing how AFAC came to have this operational role with respect to sharing of resources interstate? Yes. Now, um, basically, there was an increasing, over time, an increasing trend of the need to reinforce uh, combat three, And I, I put that down clearly to climate change um, and not just fires, but cyclones, floods, um, storms. So climate change has been driving an escalation in these events. Um, and there was a need to coordinate. So it was a very ad hoc arrangement. I think the first cross-border operation was Ash Wednesday in 1983, very, very ad hoc. Um, then from 1994 bushfires in New South Wales, there was massive interstate co coordination needed and AFAC had to step into the breach to formalise a lot of the arrangements. 
And um, because of the Constitution saying that emergency management is a role of states and territories, there seemed to be no real interest from the federal government in stepping into this area, even from emergency management New South Wales, uh, emergency management Australia. Um, so it became a job for this um, company limited by guarantee. AFAC is not a government agency. It's funded by the Fire and Emergency Services and it's done, I think, an outstanding job over the years. And it's... Um, and so it exercises... Oh, sorry, Mr Mullins. It exercises a, essentially a quasi-governmental function in respect of those interstate arrangements, doesn't it? It does. Um, yes, it does. And it's that's not unprecedented because one of my other roles um, with the United Nations was international humanitarian relief and specifically rescue after earthquakes or urban search and rescue. And I know that Red R... and trade to send assistance. So AFAC's essentially doing that sort of work, mm. working with EMA. What's the, how's the role of uh, Emergency Management Australia changed in relation to AFAC over time in your experience? Look, a, a very close relationship and um, a good working relationship with, um, it's extremely useful to have a single go-to agency in Canberra, if, for example, military assets are required or whatever's needed from the federal government. But look, my observation, my opinion is that EMA has been subsumed into a huge bureaucracy, the Home Affairs bureaucracy. And I've heard evidence um, from Mr Cameron, the Director General, I think his, term, his um, title is of EMA now. Um, it no longer has direct access to the Prime Minister or the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, and that's a huge gap in the natural disasters space. There needs to be that instant access so that decisions can be fast and made at the top, and I don't see that anymore. And I, particularly during the bushfires, it was too slow and too late. Can I ask you some questions now about the Commissioners and Chief Officers Strategic Committee of AFAC, and that's also known as COSC. Um, how did that group come into being? Is that essentially the operationalisation of AFAC that you described before? Look, it was seen as a, another gap. Um, for example, in the counterterrorism world, um, there was... We had a dilution, I suppose, of the input of emergency services after 9-11 um, um, because the focus was on counterterrorism. Um, we used to have a uh, ministerial council for emergency ministers, emergency management ministers. They were merged some years ago, so ministerial council of police and emergency management. And when I was involved with that, we'd get about 15 minutes at the end of the meeting to talk about emergency management issues. So it was very much an afterthought, in my view. Um, there was no senior officers group, as there was in counterterrorism or policing. So we decided we would have to have a group where senior people came together and we asked if EMA would um, co-chair that to, so that we could get some direct input at the federal level, and it seemed to work quite, quite well. Um, based on your experience, how has resource sharing changed over time with the changing nature of fire seasons? Very, very difficult. And look, if I could just run you through um, very quickly, um, New South Wales fires in 0102, New South Wales, Victoria in 0102, Alpine fires, 2003, Amber fires, 2003, Cyclone Larry, 2006, Cyclone George and WA, 07, Black Saturday, Victoria, um, 09, Cyclone Yasi, 11. But, and I could go on, but just about every year now, um, because of increasing frequency and severity of extreme weather driven by climate change, we're sending resources across borders. And... It, um, and I, sorry, I might have missed your question, your direct question. Oh, sorry, the complexity, yes. So the complexity and the need for resources is becoming 
uh, more frequent. But the difficulty in sharing resources is that, for example, fire seasons used to be sequential and start in Queensland and move south over the months. And um, we could share fire trucks, aircraft, people. Um, we had a situation in 2019-20 where Queensland was burning, New South Wales was burning, Victoria was burning, um, South Australia was burning, and we had fires starting to kick off in Tasmania and some in Western Australia. So where do we get the resources? We had to bring them in internationally. They were still burning. And um, I was in California in November last year at the Kincaid fire, and they're shaking their heads about the longer fire seasons driven by climate change, um, restricting our ability to share resources. Um, because you mentioned it, I was going to ask you this question in a little while. Um, some questions about your experience in firefighting internationally. And you had the opportunity to observe um, firefighting arrangements at that Kincaid fire in November 2019. Is that right? Uh, um, we didn't hear your audio, uh, Mr Mullins, but I could um, read your lips and you said that's correct. Is that right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Now, uh, it says my microphone's been unmuted. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just for the Commissioner's assistance, the Kincaid fire started on the 23rd of October 2019 and burned 77,000 acres or 31,000 hectares until the fire was fully contained on the 6th of November 2019. The fire was the largest of the 2019 California wildfire season and also the largest wildfire ever to occur in Sonoma County in California. Um, Mr Mullins, of course, prior to that, you were deployed to a major brush fire in San Diego County, California in the mid-90s, is that right? That's correct. And you were also a Churchill Fellow in 1995 and your research was on the use of aircraft and modern incident management systems in bushfire control and you considered France, Spain, Canada and the United States of America. Yes, that's correct. Just based on your observations of those other jurisdictions internationally, um, do those jurisdictions create a national operating framework for emergency management? Yes, they do. There's um, very well-developed national arrangements and, um, that incorporate national, state and uh, regional emergency management uh, thank you. Um, what is done in particular in the United States to achieve interoperability between agencies and across jurisdictions? So there's a national interagency fire centre in Boise, Idaho, which I've visited, um, that essentially coordinates resources between the federal um land management agencies. So the US Forest Service runs that, but there's Bureau of Land Management, Bureau of Indian Affairs. There's a seven agent, uh, five agencies, as well as the US Fire Administration. Through the US Fire Administration, those um, arrangements flow down to state and municipal fire departments. So there's a sharing, a national um, um, database of available resources, incident management teams can move around the country, teams of uh, specially trained firefighters, um, fire engines and aircraft. So it's a, and the same sort of arrangements exist over the border in Canada, uh, the Canadian Interagency Fire Centre. They also administer um, international agreements, including with Australia. Um, based on your view that uh, interstate assistance, at least in Australia, is becoming increasingly complex because of longer uh, bushfire and natural disaster seasons and your experience internationally, uh, do you think that there's a greater role for national coordination of emergency management in Australia? Yes, I do. Um now, why do I say that? And it's because of the increasing 
frequency and severity of extreme weather events. And if I could um, put it into a bit of a military context, and I'm not a military person, but I've been watching the enemy for 50 years now, and the enemy's geared up. Um, you could say they've like they've suddenly got nuclear weapons, and we're still trying to deal with that with conventional forces, and we need more help. So there's a, you know, I've said publicly a number of times there's a need for a step change in how we deal with the enemy being um, climate change and and how that's affecting natural disasters and fires, and we need a step change in how we coordinate the insufficient resources we have to deal with this threat. Uh, thank you, Mr Mullins. Uh, commissioners, those are my questions. No, I think, uh, I think it was good. That was good, very good insight and a very good uh, insight into the history of AFAC as well and how it's evolved. And then also, uh, Mr Mullins, your opinion on national coordination and where you would view that would need to go based on your extensive experience. We appreciate that uh, very much. So we appreciate the insight and also we appreciate uh, your ongoing service to the nation uh, as well, still serving uh, in an organisation obviously you love and you're quite passionate about uh, that community service. So thank you very much for that. Do we have any more questions? Uh, Mr. Mullins? Uh, no, I might just pause to check that okay. there hasn't been any contact by parties with leave to appear. No? No, there has not been. Uh, the next step is may Mr Mullins be released from his summons? He may be released from his summons. Once again, Mr Mullins, thank you very much. Appreciate you spending thank the morning you. with us. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we... That takes us to morning tea, Chair. How about we take an adjournment until 11.45 Canberra time? So about 12 minutes, that'll be plenty. OK, thank you. All rise.
no laughter. <sighs> the Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Ms Hogan Doran. <laughs> Uh, Chair, Commissioners, in the finest traditions of the bar, Mr. S Mr. Glover and Ms. Spees are stepping in um, on and off today at short notice to take witnesses that I was supposed to take. We're going to see how I go with this one. Good luck with the voice. <laughs> Thank you. I call Dr. Wayne Gregson. Dr. Gregson, good morning. Good morning. Dr. Gregson will take an oath. Dr. Gregson, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Dr. Gregson, um, you were formerly the Fire and Emergency Services Commissioner of the Department of Fire and Emergency Services in WA. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, we'll just see how the connection goes with you. It was a little bit unstable then. Uh, you were in that role from 2012 to 2017? That's correct. All right. Um, what was your background... Right. Sorry, but what was your background leading into taking on that role? Um, I was uh, a West Australian police officer from 1980 to uh, 2011. I then acted as the Chief Executive Officer of the West Australian Fire and Emergency Services Authority for 12 months before assuming the role of the inaugural Commissioner in 2011. And is that role of Fire and Emergency Services um, a, an all-hazards role? That is, it not just... Uh, uh, what else is it capturing within it? It's all hazards, yes, that's correct. Natural hazards, uh, fire and emergency services, fire both rural and urban, and marine and rescue. As well. All right. Um, in the submission yeah. that you've provided to the Royal Commission, you outline a, number of emerg a very large number of emergency incidents um, which uh, had a review or inquiry during the period of your term as uh, uh, as Commissioner, if we could just have drawn up uh, WGR 500-001-0067-0068. Uh, and have them put side by side, if possible. Dr Gregson, can you see that from your end? Yes, I can. Right. Now, these are just the um, major incidents which had uh, a review or inquiry during the course of your term. Um, what is uh, notable amongst other matters is uh, one can draw a line, a chronology from, from the right to the left and back again, seeing the consecutive cyclone and storm events and fire events uh, moving down through that timeline. Um, I'll just invite you to speak to the commissioners so they can have a sense uh, of the um, uh, uh, operational stance that is required uh, to meet these quite different hazards and manage these kinds of um, consecutive and, in some circumstances, compounding uh, um, uh, natural hazard risks. Well, Western Australia is a very large and diverse state and the Department of Fire and Emergency Services is an all hazards, as you um, articulated, is an all hazards agency, having responsibility as a hazard management authority for um, a number of emergency management events. And it's also customary after event or post event to do a post event or post incident review. So what you're seeing articulated in those exhibits is um, a list of incidents whereby there would have been a review at the conclusion of that incident. And what is there a was there a, was there in your term a mechanism by which those um, the recommendations from those reviews were uh, taken up and monitored in terms of their implementation? Yes, there are. Um, there is. Um, there was an almighty spreadsheet in the Department of Fire and Emergency Services whilst I was there that not only included 
uh, post-incident recommendations, but also recommendations of uh, some of the bigger um, statewide buyers where others may have looked at it. For example, there were in investigations and inquiries external to the agency. Those recommendations would be captured and monitored as with regards to the implementation of those recommendations. To what extent is um, organisational culture important in determining or affecting how recommendations for change are taken up and actually implemented? Oh, well, I think culture is very important more generally for any for implementing any form of change. Um, but I, my experience with the Department of Fire and Emergency Services and, and all of the volunteers that are engaged uh, and related to it, and, and indeed right across the state of Western Australia with other agencies, is there's quite an appetite for continuous improvement and learning from um, events, emergency management events, to see if one can do better as an, either as an individual or as an agency. We've heard the phrase continuous improvement occasionally during the course of this Royal Commission. Um, other than what it sounds like on the box, what it says on the box, continuous improvement, what's the... You know, what does it actually mean in practice? That is, is it more than just having a, a, big, a big spreadsheet and someone being in charge of, you know, adding to that spreadsheet and following up? Um, how does it actually uh, well, become operationalised? Well, yeah. well, in essence, you're there about closing capability gaps. So if there's been a shortfall in the response or lessons learned where you can do something tangible to make a difference to the next time you have to respond I think continuous improvement in that context is about cl closing the capability gap uh, between uh, where you once were and, and where you strive to be. I, d I don't think it's just about ticking off recommendations on a spreadsheet, because if you get into that habit, um, you can find ways of justifying saying you've completed the recommendation when in actual fact you may have technically completed the recommendation, but you haven't made a tangible difference in closing the capability gap. So. That has to be monitored carefully, and I think that that's perhaps where you get the intersect of culture. And and just going on from what you said, is is continuous improvement therefore in part also a mindset within an organisation? No, I think continuous improvement is exactly that. It's about closing the capability gap, um, making sure that you can, in real terms, make a difference on in terms of in when you're responding to the incident, that you have actually made a, a tangible improvement. So um, I wouldn't say, I would say culture is related to that in terms of um, what sort of an organisation you are, how change ready you are, how receptive to change you are. Um, and all organisations struggle um, with the impact of culture when they try and implement any form of change. Right, I want to go back to um, page uh, 65 of your submission and just pick up a, two, a couple of pieces uh, that are mentioned there. The first is that you, you came into the role uh, as Fire and Emergency Services a Commissioner having with a background in policing, as you said, uh, and also a Master of Business Administration 2000 from Edith Cowan University. Um, but I'm interested to understand uh, what what drove you to undertake a Doctor of Philosophy and in Innovation at the University of New England, which appears you completed towards the end of your to towards the end of your service as um, uh, Fire and Emergency Services Commissioner? What motivated me to do that? You mean? Yes. Well, I always think that you one should, as an individual, try and improve yourself um, from both an operational perspective and an academic. perspective perspective so that you can uh, become almost um, an academic practitioner. I think it's very important that decisions taken are ev evidence-based and that you have a good understanding of the thinking or the philosophy behind decision-making. Uh, and to me, um, ever since I began as a police cadet, I have embarked on continuous educational improvement throughout my career. Um, and I think the Doctor of Philosophy was one which allowed me to have a look at something really tangible within my place, think of deeply and, and hopefully make a, a more meaningful contribution as Commissioner. To, to what, I want to just, just take from that, to what extent um, can innovation be uh, um, 
um, incorporated into responding to these sorts of uh, post-event inquiries? You've mentioned continuous improvement. Am I right in understanding there's a distinction or an add-on by taking an innovation mindset? Well, I think um, innovation is probably one of the most um, overused sort of phrases. It's a sort of early 21st century catchphrase, catch-all phrase, but by innovation, I'm talking about where you can make a difference on the ground uh, by, if you like, thinking outside of the box. Some, I mean, um, how do I explain it? In, in short terms, it's about capturing ideas that will make a difference, predominantly, in my view, from the troops on the ground. Mm -hmm. Those closest to the ground tend, tend to have the... Uh, some really good ideas and if the organisation can be shaped in a way that it can put those good ideas into effect, then I think that's where innovation is playing its role into getting a forward-looking um, organisation. You mentioned uh, volunteers. There's a significant volunteer um, force in WA who contribute to uh, the work done by um, uh, under in responding to natural disasters, both bushfires and I, I anticipate also a cyclone and storm events, um, how do you how does how do organisations at a state level um, obtain that engagement? What are the methods by which that engagement or feedback can be usefully um, uh, gathered? Well, I think there's a whole variety of uh, stakeholder engagement tools that. You, one can use as an organisation and in fact we did use at the Department of Fire and Emergency Services to um, interact, gather ideas. There are You build in feedback mechanisms through having volunteer meetings with associations. You can have uh, portals for ideas to be submitted from the troops on the ground. When I was commissioner I regularly visited and I, I'm talking on a weekly basis either a career fire station or a volunteer brigade group or unit to have that exchange with them on ideas. Um, I think there are a whole variety of stakeholder engagement tools uh, and if you are open as an organisation and people think that their ideas can actually be be translated into funds on the board and you build that culture of engagement and willingness to participate in, again, that catchphrase, continuous improvement or the betterment of an organisation, both um, culturally and operationally. On page uh, 66 of your submission, you, you mentioned what I think you've just uh, foreshadowed under innovation, um, a strategy of incorporating online stakeholder engagement through a portal to progress. Is that what you were talking about, that volunteers can actually directly provide recommendations uh, to to the agencies through that process? Yes, that was um, an, an idea that um, I was very passionate about and indeed was the subject matter of my doctoral studies. And that was that you have a way of uh, engaging um, in almost an egalitarian way with the entire workforce. Um, my view is, and I've often stated it, is rank doesn't give you a monopoly on good ideas. And so the portal to progress was a method of drawing ideas from everybody, having those ideas assessed on their merits. Uh, obviously, there still requires to be some corporate prioritisation. You don't, you will never have enough resources, uh, either money or people, to implement every idea. But it is, it was one way which I thought was a really good, appropriate way to get ideas from the troops on the ground. So um, you also mentioned a number of other items which the commissioners can see uh, are concerning in which you introduced uh, other changes during the period of your term. In fact, um, you mentioned at the early, in the earlier page that you were appointed with a clear mandate for cultural and structural reform. Um, the organisation yes. had reputational damage, cultural issues and was exposed to major operational, corporate and strategic risk. Um, it, yes. When, when faced with those kinds of problems in an organisation and um, given a clear mandate to bring cultural and structural reform, um, uh, to what extent do you, does that require um, working across agencies, even outside the agencies that you're, um, which comes within your direct responsibility? Oh, I think it's a very important 
part of any form of um, operational, uh, a government organisation, particularly one that engages 20,000 or more volunteers, has to have uh, intrinsic links into community and intrinsic links into other organisations that form part of the bigger picture. Um, so relationships with other hazard management or agencies, for example, police, communities, uh, ch various charities, they're, they're fundamental in building the overarching capability of the state of Western Australia and even broader, quite frankly. Um, they are essential for optimising um, the resources that one might require to combat whatever is thrown at us from an incident management, emergency management perspective. Well, you've, you've talked about, um, just in what you've said, and also in the part, portions that I've taken the commissioners to about organisational change within um, within uh, your organisation and just within the immediate government. I want to take you now to um, some of the organisational changes outside um, those fears. Uh, we had some evidence in the previous session about the uh, creation of, of AFAC and uh, right back to the mid-90s and some um, evidence concerning how it has changed over time. Uh, you were um, initially involved in the AFAC Conference Steering Committee in Perth 2012 and ultimately became a Treasurer and Councillor um, on AFAC. I have a couple of questions that emerge from that. First up, uh, a, a Conference Steering Committee, I take it that, um, was that your first um, a connection with AFAC? Yes, um, that was pretty much. I became commissioner and I was advised as part of the handover such that it was that I was um, responsible for hosting or Western Australia was responsible for hosting um, the um, uh, AFAC conference that year, um, which is a, a, a shared responsibility. Um, and... Um, that was my first introduction stroke engagement to the Australasian Fire Authorities Council. One of the things that Mr Mullins said in the previous session when he was he was trying to recall and he um, that that the state emergency services joined AFAC in about, he thought maybe in about 2011. Now that's about the time you came on 2012. Were state emergency services participating in AFAC um, at that time when you joined? I believe so, but I couldn't say definitively. But I do believe that they were already represented in AFAC at that stage. All right. and um, you've If not, it was very soon thereafter. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, the, you became a treasurer and councillor. How was is, how is AFAC funded during the time that you were treasurer? AFAC's funded predominantly at the time I was treasurer by subscriptions from its membership base and by... Um, a profit line from hosting the annual uh, conference or the annual trade show, call it what you will, exhibition. I see. Um, and when you say member subscriptions, you mean contributions by the relevant state and territory fire or emergency services that are members of AFAC? Yes, I believe there are a few others, but um, by and large, yes, from the members, the state and territory members of AFAC. Right, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about the Commissioner and Chief Officer Strategic Committee. I take it that you joined that committee when you became um, Fire and Emergency Services Commissioner in 2012? I believe, no, I believe it came into existence uh, after I joined. You're quite right, 2015, I'm just reminded. Uh, the, um, were you involved in the decision to establish that strategic committee? Yes. What was the purpose uh, at the time of establishing that committee in that form? Um, it was predominantly so the commissioners and chief officers would have a forum uh, where they could share ideas. Uh, it was also so they could give each other situational reports on emerging um, issues in their state, emerging incidents in their state in, in near real time. And it's also a forum which brought about the, or enabled us to more easily share uh, resources across state and territory boundaries. The responsibility for that rests with the fire commissioners, and so we wanted a responsive uh, and agile way of uh, getting a situational awareness on incidents and then facilitating assistance to, <coughs> let's call it the host state, should that be required. 
So that was the that was the role of uh, the COSC when it first came into being, and I believe it still is. To what extent, um, when it was established and up until the time you left, which was in about September 2017, I imagine, uh, that, or certainly in 2017, to what extent was COSC itself a decision-making body? Um, look, in the context that all commissioners and chief officers and their respective states are fully independent, um, it's more of a collaborative body rather than a decision-making body. But COSC would be about um, the facilitation and agreement of resource sharing across the various jurisdictions and indeed um, went a long way to standardising our arrangements with international deployments. Which I wanted to ask you about international deployments. How did that change over the time that you were um, Commissioner uh, in WA? I think in the early days, the arrangements for in international um, deployment were more relationship-based, and whilst there were in existence agreements, they were generally in the um, in the forester space. They were generally with the land managers, conservation and land managers space. So it it morphed or matured. I'd like to think um, over the years to be much more embracing of various hazards and much more um, formal in terms of the arrangements with overseas. And we learnt a lot and worked collaboratively with the various land conservation land managers to come up with um, really good international and interstate agreements for resource sharing. To what extent during the time that you were Commissioner did you have deployed in WA international deployments? Um, oh, I'd have to go back and have a look at that, but I think we did. We have we did contribute officers into Canada and North America that I'm aware of, and I also know that we contributed uh, incident commanders or deputy incident commanders to some flooding in um, in Asia. I forget where it was. It may have been Indonesia, but I do remember. Could have been Cambodia actually that we sent someone up to assist in command. Uh, establishing a command and control centre. And what about deployments into WA from international... Um, I am not sure we did any of that whilst I was there. I think subsequently we may have had some, but, um, look, I'd have to go back and check. I actually don't recall what the size of contingents and where they were from internationally during my period. That's all right. You mentioned incident controllers. Was the experience... That, as best you can recall, uh, that that, it, that primarily the value in exchange was bringing in um, uh, uh, incident controllers as opposed to troops on the ground, so to speak, and I'll say that in a, in a colloquial sense. No, definitely not. Um, the, the, the advantage of the Australasian Inter-Service Incident Management System is that you can um, exchange people in instant command and control much more easily and that does bring about that sort of facility arrangements um, but no it was not centred centred just around instant command and control uh, we would send boots on the ground um, made up of, con of contingents made up of volunteers and DFES and DFES personnel right across the spectrum Given the, the, the size and the scale of Western Australia and all of those incidents that I identified to the commissioners, the cyclone and storm events, as well as the bushfire events that occur over time in WA, to what extent in your period of, uh, of office did you rely on Commonwealth resources in order to assist you to meet um, or will respond to natural hazard um, events? I think we rely on the Pilbara Regiment uh, on a low-level DFAC request to provide assistance oftentimes during flooding, mm -hmm. and that's most often done by local arrangements. So um, I don't recall having uh, to make requests of the Commonwealth mm -hmm. for defence or, say, to the civil power um, on events that we ran in Western Australia, not not to my recollection. All right, thank you. Um, I mean, they're not based here, you see, so it would be quite some 
argument to tempt them across to Western Australia, whereas in Queensland they're, they're read, much more readily available and more often used. Right. Um, the last matter I wanted to raise with you was your current role. As I understand, um, since you've retired from the role of Fire and Service Commissioner, you've been brought back in as an incident controller for COVID-19 for the Department of Education. Um, just in take the question in two parts, just to explain to the commissioners in a very brief way what that role encompasses. And then I want to ask you to describe to the commissioners what your experience of national coordination has been um, in the COVID response or having, having identified a limited one in terms of the Commonwealth one's response in your former role. I'm not quite sure I follow the question. Certainly the first part... Let's I, do it in I, parts. I can answer. <laughs> Yeah, OK. It is true. I was asked to um, assist the West Australian Department of Education in the role of instant controller for COVID-19. That entails making sure that they have really good um, structural arrangements in terms of instant management. Uh, so we have adopted, uh, well, in Western Australia, as you're aware, uh, the Hazard Management Authority for Pandemic rests with the Department of Health, um, but it's expected by the State Emergency Coordinator, that's the Police Commissioner, that all agencies who have any role, including education, or um, have, a, have good uh, structures, processes and systems in place to enable them to do what they are required during the pandemic with respect to their own departments and also if required, to assist and liaise and coordinate with the Hazard Management Authority. My role here, therefore, has been to set up um, those systems and processes, um, ably assisted by two uh, deputy instant controllers, one with predominant focus on schools uh, from schools background and one with predominant focus on non-school sites, for want of a better term, uh, so that we could ensure in the Department of Education a minimal impact uh, from the pandemic on schools and also business continuity more broadly across the Department of Education. I, um, does that help? It does, thank you. And it helped to remind me that I'd missed a question that I wanted to raise with you. So I'm going to double back. Talking about the importance of incident controllers uh, and uh, um, uh, and the, the importance of that in terms of working across agencies. You were discussing earlier or telling the commissioners earlier about the AIM system, which is the incident management system that was has been um, uh, instituted across fire and emergency agencies across Australia. Um, uh, through the AFAC process, as I understand it, it has enabled that um, ability... It, sorry, let's withdraw that. It has promoted the ability to resource share between different states and territories because the incident commanders are all operating on a standardised system. Is that a fair summary of the position, as you understand it? Now I can... uh, and and it's not, not just fire, fire and not just fire, but many agencies across the sector adopt the, uh, that system. Uh, the police have one which is very, very similar. Um, for all intents and purposes, it's exactly the same, except the police oftentimes have an investigative cell and an and a intelligence cell. Um, but by and large, um, it's, um, it's aims. That incident management system, was that in place when you um, became uh, Fire and Emergency Services Commissioner in 2012? Absolutely, right. yes. It's been in, in place for many years and, and, and been... And did that, um, uh, in your observation, assist in minimising, uh, at least in relation to incident management control, the um, having different, uh, different uh, um, uh, foreign emergency workers moving interstate and operating in different states, even though they've come from a different... Uh, home jurisdiction. Correct. It allows for seamless transition of interstate deployment into IMT pools right across the instant control, planning, op operations, logistics. Um, it allows for that. Uh, it, it's a standard method. Uh, it's standard training and it allows for that um, seamless deployment. That sort of uh, standard systems and training, uh, is that something you have seen uh, as between the states uh, for communications and equipment uh, for uh, emergency responders who were moved interstate to assist? 
I haven't had a lot of experience in this in this area. Communicate, communi we don't send vehicles interstate because of the uh, tyranny of distance, uh, but we do deploy um, officers to the state. There hasn't, I haven't had reports of too much. It, it, increasingly, it gets more and more standardised, uh, but you do hear stories um, about slightly different methods on the fire ground, but they are overcome. All right. Um, you also mentioned in your submission, which I'm just going to pick up, establishment of a new Fire and Emergency Services Academy uh, during your period as Fire and Emergency Services Commissioner. Um, does that involve training? Uh, that has a training arrangements. Um, sorry, I'll start that again. Did that academy during your term uh, include any training for interstate uh, operations? That is to assist those people to know how to operate interstate? Um, I'm not sure. Um, we have a really good professional development pathways in Western Australia uh, and in conjunction with the SIMSEN, they do deliver very high quality standard and I haven't had a look at the curriculum to tell you whether or not that would discuss interstate deployment. But given that we do have a role, when there is interstate deployment, there is a liaison officer always deployed with the contingent uh, and um, so it would not at all surprise me if that was not covered in that training. And when you say liaison officer, you mean a liaison officer from the receiving jurisdiction? They usually appoint both so that when the contingent, the arriving contingent arrives, there's always a contingent leader, and liaison officer, and there's always a host liaison officer to host and assist the arriving continue. Uh, um, the arriving contingent, make sure that they're obviously all their logs and accommodation, etc., is provided for and that they're appropriately briefed uh, before they go into their respective roles on the fire ground. And you mentioned uh, the word or the acronym SIMSEM. I understand that's the Simulation Centre, uh, which uh, I take it has real time simulation of events. Uh, what kind yeah. of scope of activities are captured in that uh, training centre? Oh, it can be, conf it's um, quite configurable. So you can do training at all levels right up to dates of emergency and you can train in all roles, either collectively or as individual cells. All right. Um, so all I had to ask of Dr. Gregson at this time, Commissioners. Thank you, Ms. Hogan Dora. Commissioner McIntosh. Commissioner Bennett. Oh, I think that was a uh, good insight from the, the WA perspective and, uh, and discussion about cultural change and, uh, and what you went through for a reorganisation at large. So Mr Gregson, uh, we appreciate your time this morning with us and uh, in giving us that insight. So, Gondoran, is that all for Mr Gregson? I think it is, Commissioner. Yes, it is. I'm reminded. Mr Gregson, you may be released from your summons. We appreciate <laughs> you joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. I think it's going back, going back to Mr Glover now. Thank you for steadfastly holding on there, Ms Hogan-Doran. Thank you very much. Mr Glover. Uh, Chair, I call Lee Johnson. Uh, Mr Johnson. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Commissioner. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, Mr Johnson will take the affirmation. Mr Johnson, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr Johnson, you were the Commissioner of Queensland Fire and Emergency Services, or QFES, from 2002 to 2015, is that right? That is correct, yes. And you have served as an operational firefighter for 39 years with QFES. Yes, so I started my career in 1975 in Townsville in North Queensland and served at a number of locations across the state. 
During your tenure as commissioner, what did the role entail? Uh, the role entailed, I guess in those days we were called, we'd moved from the Queensland Fire and Rescue Authority to the Queensland Fire and Rescue Service to the Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. So a number of iterations, but basically it was to protect life, property and the environment uh, with the powers and abilities of the service being applied. So really uh, it was an urban fire service principally, um, but also hazardous materials, chemical, biological, radiological and uh, nuclear assets and, and equipment, urban search and rescue, road accident rescue, and quite a number of rescue disciplines, including uh, rescue from heights. So an all round, the major focus at that time was on the urban fire service and the rural fire service uh, was evolving because fundamentally from 1990, the Rural Fire Service in Queensland became part of the Fire and Rescue Service under the Fire and Rescue Service Act. And then I'd like to describe it as a journey of maturity over my career, that we evolved from a fire brigade to a fire and rescue service to a fire and emergency service. And did that emergency services, oh, sorry, I'll start that again. Did that evolution to emergency services then incorporate other natural disasters other than fires? Yes, we, we played an increasing role in the broader emergency management world. So if you describe the fire and rescue services part, as part of emergency services and the broader emergency management world, which is whole of government, local government, communities, all the departments of government, private industry, the like. And uh, particularly after we developed the urban search and rescue capability, um, it taught us a lot about logistics, operating in the field independently and fundamentally keeping people at the front line for 24 hours a day, seven days a week as needed. So we gradually evolved into a much greater participative role in the broader emergency management world. Uh, thank you. So what role did your organisation have in relation to natural disasters such as tropical cyclones and floods? Yeah, we were very, uh, very involved because of the ability for the fire service and the fire and emergency services as it is now, which also now includes has since 2013, emergency management and the state emergency service are all in the one service, CUFUS. But uh, with our ability to rapidly deploy our USAR teams who were tasked with things like uh, rapid damage assessment, particularly for cyclone activity and also with flooding, we were able to deploy large numbers of people with the logistic support housing, feeding, communications into remote areas and stay there um, for, for the necessary time. So, yes, we're heavily involved in a lot of floods, a lot of cyclones and increasingly bushfires. Thank you. Uh, Mr Johnson, I think as you are aware, this Royal Commission is looking at national coordination arrangements for natural disasters. So I'd like to ask you some questions about the Australasian Fire and Emergency Service Authorities Council, or AFAC as it is known. Um, if you were listening to the evidence of Mr Mullins before, I think the questions will be along similar lines. And that is because you served as president of AFAC from 2009 to 2013, is that right? That is correct, and I was the deputy president prior to that. Thank you. Um, I would like you to answer based on your experience of AFAC, so please put your experience of Queensland's arrangements to one side and consider the national perspective. Um, can you please describe how during the time period of your association with AFAC, its role developed and changed? Yes, AFAC uh, is the peak council for all the emergency services in Australasia. And over time, uh, its relationship was 
fundamentally to the federal government or the Australian government through EMA. Also, um, the other committees like NZMC, Australian National New Zealand Emergency Management Committee, AFAC wasn't part of that. But all, at all times, I think the journey that AFAC's undergone is seeking greater connectivity and connection with, with the Australian government. And variably, that's, that's happened. And one example of that is, uh, fundamentally, the Australian government through EMA has subcontracted out a lot of the role that EMA used to do in terms of previous counter-disaster college in Mount Macedon and other arrangements. So with, with a business unit of AFAC called ADA, a lot of the work is now fundamentally subcontracted uh, by the government. So I think what's missing is the recognition of emergency services, and I differentiate between emergency management and emergency services, needs to be much greater. We don't have the natural connection that uh, police, law and order, health and education, which are all, uh, you know, uh, the federal government has got uh, departments including that. So I, I would certainly urge a greater connection for the emergency services sector into the federal government. Can you please describe for us how AFAC um, developed a role with respect to resource coordination between the states and territories? Yes, well, in reality, it, it was this journey we've all been on over over the last 40 or more, more years where interstate deployments, when I first joined, you weren't allowed out of the local city boundary unless the local fire brigade board chairman allowed you. From there, in my time, to sending firefighters to Christchurch on Air Force C-17s and Japan for collapse rescue work, which the USAR team. So a fundamentally very large shift. And mostly Queensland firefighters, both paid and volunteer, would move south to help out in the bushfire seasons. But we've certainly had New South Wales Rural Fire Service come to Queensland in 09. We've had New South Wales USAR in the Grantham and Brisbane floods. Uh, all sorts of things have happened. So the number of times that we move into state is basically a very common occurrence. And therefore, the need to make sure that was, was coordinated was taken up by AFAC itself. And um, I don't see why that coordination role can't continue to be done by AFAC. Possibility with an opportunity to uh, have some federal buy-in or Australian government buy-in or, or agency. Um, we could create another agency of the federal government. My only word of caution there is uh, the mantra regarding too much bureaucracy. AFAC is doing a job now. It was modelled on fundamentally the CIFC arrangements, the Canadian arrangements. Uh, certainly that's the arrangements for NAFC, the use of and sharing of aircraft across Australia, but also the Canadian one does move uh, resources. So it's possible that AFAC could continue to do that with uh, some support from uh, EMA, similar to the ADA arrangements possibly, uh, but that may or may not be sufficient in, in view of my statement regarding the greater recognition for emergency services within the Australian government structures. So I was just going to ask you about that. Um, and in light of your view that there should be some uh, increasing uh, recognition with respect to emergency services, uh, do you think there's a greater... What do you think about a greater role the Australian government could play in relation to emergency services management in relation to natural disasters in particular? Well, I think it's multifaceted in the sense that um, there's a lot that the federal government, I keep getting my terms mix, mixed up, but the Australian government can do. And particularly, if we go back to one statistic that I saw in an uh, audit office report in 2014, 80% of all requests or support that come from the states to EMA or through EMA are for ADF support. And uh, my mantra 
I guess, over many years, particularly following Tropical Cyclone Lowry in 2006, was I realised that emergency services needed to operate in a more military-like um, fashion. And, and what I mean by that, and this is where the federal government can support with experts, and, and probably what's missing is some kind of national command college that teaches a lot about the staff officer roles and planning and logistics, intelligence, and the strategy of dealing with very large-scale battles, if you like. In my view, is we're confronted with a lot of battles in a greater climate change war. That's what we're dealing with. So the other area is communications, intelligence, surveillance, support, getting some kind of structure that can assist, uh, not necessarily pulling on ADF resources, but the knowledge that goes into the technology of military uh, technology, if you like, can be, be best deployed, or how could it best be deployed to support the services? Because the fundamental point with that is, what is critical is the quality and timeliness of the information we get from the fire ground or from the flood zone or from the cyclone zone, because that information goes up the tree and fundamentally to public information, which assists with evacuation, the timeliness of evacuation and the accuracy. So the better spatial, uh, geospatial information, timeliness of that is, is absolutely critical. And in this day and age, we should be able to deploy the very best uh, technology. Um, just taking up that point on um, communications, I was going to ask you a specific question with respect to um, the interoperability of communication systems across jurisdictions. What is your experience of that interoperability? Uh, fundamentally, we're not totally interoperable in terms of uh, one state directly talking to another, but through the AIM system, there's quite an extensive work on communications planning for work on various fire grounds. And, and when we send a, a task force interstate, or could also be called a support force, a group of people going interstate generally have to be self-contained. And one of the things that they take with them, obviously, is their local communications to talk to each other in the task force. But also some methodology is either supplied by the receiving state and the principle there is only the commander is talking to the control point. So you don't have 50 trucks radioing into the major control point, if you know what I mean. There's, there's discipline in terms of how the radio plans and comms plans are structured, and that's proper. But we all have legacy communication systems across the state. Some have very advanced digital trunk radio systems, Others have dated VHF and UHF systems. And there's also an issue with spectrum management that ACMA, Australian Communications and Media Authority, really needs to get involved in and assist in that space. Um, I was certainly on the Committee for the Public Safety Mobile Broadband idea that came out of the digital divide uh, issues over a number of years ago, but I'm not sure that that's progressed too far after quite a number of years. So there are workarounds within the AIMS command and control structure for interstate people to operate in another jurisdiction. And so just picking up on your answer then with respect to AIMS, so that's the Australasian Inter-Service Incident Management System, um, can you just describe to us in your experience, how that system works and what its benefits are? Yes, certainly. I, uh, I chaired the fourth edition review of AIMS, uh, which was published in 2013, and it works on a number of principles, and they are functional management, management by objectives, span of control are the main ones, but unity of command and also flexibility. So it's a system of breaking down, particularly the span of control issue is, is very important, but it allocates what in a military sense uh, people understand as staff jobs like planning, uh, logistics, uh, intelligence, 
in a range of support functions. And in fact, it was brought into Australia following the Ash Wednesday bushfires from North America, uh, the NIMS system that operates there. Uh, ours is similar, not exactly the same, but very similar. And it all came out of fundamentally the uh, NATO or the American military concept. So that it's very much a military uh, concept and is widely used by all fire and emergency services across Australia. The police uh, don't use AIMS. They use a very similar system uh, based on the same sorts of principles. And it, it uh, I think, can... It, there's a new addition out, 2017, but it could do with that concept of the National Command College, something like that. We all send our officers to the Australian Institute of Police Management for leadership and management training to get the qualifications in that area along with the police. But there is no national approach to that teaching the strategy of leading and managing large scale um, uh, operations. So that would be an area that could also benefit. But AIMS is well recognised and it's the single tool that enables us to go across border and to go to North America. Because once the teams that are requested, and much of the support that's requested by interstate services is actually for incident management team members, not necessarily direct line firefighters. That happens too. But many of the requests are to send fire behaviour specialists, um, planners, all that sort of back-end work, because the key to all this, in my view, is what we're doing is... You take New South Wales this season, probably on one given day, they had 120 battles going on, each of those managed by an incident management team and controlled by that incident management team. And uh, the, a lot of the authority is actually delegated to the front line. Not all of it, but a lot of it is. So you've got a lot of troops in contact, a lot of fleet, a lot of vehicles all manoeuvring around a very large number of fire grounds. This is very complex and uh, we can get better at it. Um, I'd just like to ask you um, about... Um, your experience in relation to uh, assistance provided by the ADF. Uh, you'd mentioned that a couple of times uh, earlier in your evidence. Um, I know that you were involved in the response to the 2010-2011 floods in Queensland. Um, so far, the Royal Commission has heard quite a lot about ADF assistance in relation to bushfires. Can you please just, um, for the assistance of the Commission, uh, tell us about your experience with the ADF in a flood context? Yes, certainly. Uh, the ADF in the 10-11 uh, floods in Queensland, when basically, <clears throat> excuse me, 80% of the state was flooded, and many areas were flooded three times. Uh, country towns or regional towns like Emerald flooded three times. That year, obviously, Queensland is extremely well practised um, with, with the use of ADF support because we're probably the most disaster-prone state in the, in the nation. But fundamentally, the ADF came in with a massive array of support from virtually every aircraft type the Air Force had, including C-17s, C-130s, um, aviation from the Army, the different types of helicopters, all the ground transport and engineering support. Uh, and some of those assets were used in the res life rescue in very hazardous situations, particularly the helicopters, and the evacuation of, of people on a large scale out of uh, very dangerous areas. So the amount of support we got from the ADF was just fundamental in, in the whole thing going forward, and not simply in the recovery phase, but in an operational role such as flying a helicopter. That's something well within their disciplines. It's not the same as being, you're not qualified to fight a bushfire. They can certainly fly in, in all sorts of weather conditions and what have you. But the ADF uh, support, and the other thing I want to say about that is 
In terms of the support given by the ADF, the community has an expectation that the green machine broadly is going to turn up and it gives a morale lift to communities when they see uh, our Defence Forces assisting and that, that's something that's part of, I suppose, the Australian nature and way. But the ADF in flooding were able to supply us with all sorts of equipment um, and support. Uh, why is that so? Why do we need it? Because fundamentally the state agencies don't have the backbone that would be called combat service support. So the logistics, the engineering, um, comms, you name it, even field hospitals, state agencies don't have that backbone. That, or they don't have the depth of backbone. So that's a, a key reason why it's, it's offered. Now, just one co further comment on that. Um, there's possibly an opportunity for the government to look at incentivisation industry in terms of our aviation industry, bushfire aviation, firefighting aviation, logistics and other kinds of supports that, that private enterprise can pick up the pace a bit, if you like, um, and rather than, you know, place huge demand on the ADF, which is they'll come if we ask, of course. But there may be a way where there's enhancement programs or incentivisation for uh, particularly our aviation industry, for example, to increase its capacity um, and, and logistics, uh, feeding people, housing people in the field, all that sort of back end stuff is absolutely vital. And it's one of the main drivers that I had in terms of building capability within QFIS. Uh, thank you for that very comprehensive area. I'm about to move on to my final topic, which is quite discreet. It concerns the Bushfire and Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre. Uh, just before I do that, I might pause and check. I'm being told there are no questions from commissioners at this stage, so I will carry on. Uh, so, I understand you have been on the board of the Bushfire and Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre uh, since 2013, is that right? That is correct, yes. And so looking at the composition of the board, uh, and agree with me or disagree with me when I say this proposition, you seem to be the only uh, emergency services person or a person with operational experience on the board. Is that right? Uh, yes, uh, I, I am. And uh, there's been some uh, requests for other uh, members to join the board. Of course, the important thing is that the funding runs out for the CRC in June next year. And we're currently uh, in negotiations with the government to look at the future of national independent strategic research. But that's the key role that I play on the board uh, in terms of uh, that operational background. Uh, thank you. So I guess now this next question is uh, your chance to um, plug the case for further funding because what has been most useful about the work of the centre when it comes to emergency services? Well, a lot of the research uh, has been centred on uh, basically trying to assist people develop better policy, better procedures and better understanding with what's gone on. The research is across a, a basis of bar, both physical or hard sciences, if you like, uh, as well as the social sciences and uh, the areas of how people react and, and, and understand what's going on around them in terms of for example, the evacuation situation, communication. But also, uh, we saw the outcome of much of the work over two CRCs now when we had the use of the predictive fire services tool uh, surrounding the township of Gracemere. People might remember in 2018, the tool predicted that that township near Rockhampton would be under direct threat and it enabled a, the safe evacuation. So. The research that's done is independent. It's highly uh, authorised and, and appropriate, and that's what some of the experts on the on the board are there for to make sure that 
the research uh, that we do is, is of high quality. And I think the work it's done in its life has certainly helped save lives and helped uh, better operations. And it, it needs to continue into the future. There's no doubt about that. And it needs to be national strategic level research. Uh, thank you, Mr Johnson. Uh, Commissioners, I didn't have anything further for Mr Johnson. I, th I think that, uh, that final bit was very important to get an understanding of what the CRC is doing and, uh, and delivering. Had a good chance for a pitch, so we appreciate uh, Mr Johnson in giving that. Commissioner McIntosh, any questions? No. Commissioner Bennett. <coughs> no. Mr Johnson, thank you very much for joining us this morning and, uh, and your insight from your perspective from uh, Queensland, but also that CRC uh, bit at the end, and then also the integration of the, uh, the ADF uh, up, up north. So we appreciate all of that. Do we have anything else for Mr Johnson? Uh, I'll just check to make sure none of the parties with leave to appear have anything to... No. I'm being told there's no contact, so may Mr Johnson be released from his summons? He may be released from his summons. Once again, Mr Johnson, thank you very much. May I say one thing, Commissioner? Yes. Um, I'd like to commend I'd like to commend yourself and your fellow commissioners and the team on the manner and nature, the way you've treated people with dignity and respect during this, and it's to be commended. And I think it's an exemplar for the future of this type of commission because the adversarial approach certainly I've seen over many years has damaged a lot of people, particularly our volunteers. And I think what you've done and your team uh, is, is fantastic work. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for that comment. Thank you. We can adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. For lunch. So, Mr Glover, let's take an adjournment then until 14.15 Canberra time. Thank you. All rise.
Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Ms. Spies. Thank you, Commissioners. And uh, with apologies for the delay, there was a slight technical difficulty which hopefully has now been fully resolved. The, this afternoon, we have two panels of witnesses. Uh, the first panel will be um, Mr Gary Morgan and Mr Ewan Waller, both of whom are former Chief Fire Officers of the Department of Sustainability and Environment, Victoria. Mr Gary Morgan is also currently the Chairman of the Forest Fire Management Committee of the Institute of Foresters Australia. The Institute has provided a detailed submission to the Commission, um, which I will now tender. That submission is document 17.1 in the tender bundle. Okay, we'll take that as marked as an exhibit. Thank you. I call Gary Morgan and Ewan Waller. Mr Morgan, Mr Waller, good to see you on there. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, Mr Waller will be taking an oath. Mr Waller, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Mr Morgan will also be taking an oath. Mr Morgan, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr Waller, you were the Chief Fire Officer of the Victorian Department of Sustainability and Environment from 2005 to 2012, is that correct? That is correct. And uh, this period included the uh, 2009 Victorian bushfires? It did, uh, Black Saturday, that's correct. And um, you've worked in fire management as a forester for around 40 years, is that right? That's correct. And um, you're now retired from your full-time role? I have retired, but I consult in uh, forest fire, forest management and fire management and uh, farm as well. Thank you. Uh, Mr Morgan, uh, you were the Chief Fire Officer for the Department of Sustainability and Environment in Victoria prior to Mr Waller from 1996 to 2005. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, and you were also uh, the CEO of the Bushfire Cooperative Research Centre from 2007 to 2014, is that correct? That is also correct. And you are currently um, the Chairman of the Forest Fire Management Committee of the Institute of Foresters Australia. I am. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask the operator to bring up a diagram of emergency management um, agencies in Victoria. This document is RCN.900.052.0026. Mr Waller, um, can you see that diagram on your screen? I, I, I cannot, but I had a look at it uh, today, so I'm familiar with it. OK, thank you. Um, I might... In that case, just because you can't see the diagram meeting in front of you, I might ask this question of Mr. Mr. Morgan, which is um, what, uh, where in that framework um, the role of Chief Fire Officer fit? And I understand that that framework may have been different at the time that you were Chief Fire Officer. So if you could explain any changes at that between how the framework was at that time and how the framework is currently. Certainly, Council. Um, as Chief Fire Officer for the Land Management Agency then, that was 15 years ago, and um, the structure was totally different to what you've got there. At that stage, there were different ministers um, whom the Land Management Agency reported to. Um, the, the last one that, when I was there was Minister for Environment and also Deputy Premier, whereas the other minister was the police and emergency, uh, responsible police and emergency services and uh, all the rest of the emergency management went there. So in fact, there was a two parallel streams, if you like, land management, which also included fire responsibilities and then emergency management, which included all the emergency agencies. So it was a different operation then, uh, both reporting to different secretaries and different ministers. However, at the same time, 
I was involved in a number of the emergency services um, committees that they ran at that stage. I think we'll return to those committees later. Are you referring to the Forest Fire Management Group? Uh, no, uh, I, I was a chair of the Forest Fire Management Group. Um, what I was referring to then was the ones which are under the emergency management arrangements within Victoria. Mm -hmm. And that was um, the State Emergency Response Planning Committee, I think it was called at that stage. Um, and then there was the um, there was a group which I sat on for the State Crisis Centre and the State Mobile Radio Network. Ah, oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Waller. Was your um, was the position of Chief Fire Officer uh, when you had that role similar to how Mr. Morgan has just described it, or were there differences? Uh, Initially, and by the way, I can, Council, I can see the diagram now. I'll hit the right button. The, um, uh, initially, it was the same format as Mr. Morgan described, but I was part of the uh, process of evolving to the new diagram, to the new setup, which, uh, and in that, the Chief Fire Officer is the agency head. You'll see that uh, they describe uh, the agency head to take on responsibility for fires within their jurisdiction. And how, and is that, sorry, how did that change over time? Um, you said you were part of the transition to the new framework. Uh, the, as the, uh, the commissioner, the emergency management commissioner came in, uh, that position was created and then the, the agency supporting that position, uh, that was the main change, uh, and, but also strengthening regional uh, emergency management as well. So. Uh, that was a, a new tranche of work that came in, a uh, uh, formation that came in as well. So that was the, that was the most significant differences. And, and the uh, Emergency Management Commissioner taking responsible for all um, nominated uh, emergencies across across the state. And what mechanisms um, were used to strengthen regional emergency management? The strengthening regional management was the, that formally wasn't there uh, before the, uh, the structure was introduced. So that the, it was a new introduction, and then uh, it has a strategic role managing multiple issues or multiple events across across the region. Thank you, uh, Mr. Waller. I understand that um, as chief fire officer, you were part of the forest fire management group. Uh, yes, I was, and also chaired it for a number of years as well, <coughs> similar to Mr Morgan. Thank you. Um, you don't need to keep... Uh, I'm not sure if you're turning yourself on and off mute. Um, um, if you wouldn't mind just leaving that, um, we'll mute you and unmute you from this end. Um, in relation to the Forest Fire Management Group, what is the role of that group? Uh, it was to... Uh, it was uh, a group that was formed under the COAG arrangements uh, and reported into the particular the agricultural side, but it was formed specifically for the land managers across Victoria, uh, across the uh, Australia and New Zealand uh, to bring land management and forest fire management, particularly, to the uh, um, so they could feed into the the COAG process and uh, would then be uh, advising ministers and governments on the, the correct approach. And what sort of persons were part of that forest fire management group? Uh, parks and forests, uh, particularly, but uh, plantation owners as well, but particularly really concentrating and really focusing on the land management element of it um, and the forest fire element of it. So it was uh, quite strictly, but um, as you know, uh, imagine, that's uh, a large, very large area across Australia and New Zealand. Mm. Uh, Mr Morgan, um, I understand that you were also a chair of the Forest Fire Management Group? That's correct. Um, and uh, what has been your ongoing involvement with the Forest Fire Management Group since that time? Right. Well, yes, I have still got an involvement. I'm still, I've been asked to go back on to that after leaving it, and uh, that was to provide a bit of the historical doc uh, side of things to that committee. Um, and look, I'm very pleased to be involved in them because they, they, as Mr Waller mentioned, they involve all the land management people from Australia and New Zealand. But they also have the likes of research involved, so CSIRO, Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC and the University of Melbourne. 
and it is the group uh, which produced, on behalf of COAG, the National Bushfire Management Policy Statement for Forest and Rangelands, and it also has been involved in uh, the United going through the Forest Fire Management Group, which reports to the Forests and Forest Products Committee, uh, and then through to um, the Ministerial Committee, the Standing Committee for Agriculture and, and Water. And that then provides information further into the United Nations side, which goes through to the FAO's um, forest commissions, and there's six of them around the globe, and then they report in to the FAO uh, Committee of Forestry. And it's through that group that also produced the fire management voluntary guidelines. And it's fortunate to say that uh, Australia is very well served because not only are they conform with the voluntary guidelines, the United Nations voluntary guidelines, but they have the National Bushfire Management Policy Statement, and then, in the likes of Victoria, there is a code of practice all in alignment for, for good forest and land management. When I say forest, I mean all state forests, national parks and crown land. Mm -hmm. And what is the, the current status of the National Bushfire Forestry... Uh, sorry, the National Bushfire Management Policy Statements? The status of it, uh, it's still in existence and it's still uh, the national policy. It has four strategic uh, goals, which I think are very commendable. Um, and at the high level, this is where the debate really needs to be, um, in looking from a Commonwealth perspective, that there is a, a lot which can be gained out of that if we all implemented it. Um, it was the arguments have all been had about what's necessary. And if people in each of the states and territories were able to enact the policy statement and put that into their land management plans, then we wouldn't have the fires that we currently have now. Uh, Mr Waller, do you um, have any uh, comments or observations to make in relation to that topic? Uh, no, just to fully support what Gary, uh, Mr Morgan has said, that uh, it's a, a very constructive and uh, and has had high impact. It's a, that's well above its weight. It's a, it's a significant group. Uh, and it, it, um, may I just add to that? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Morgan. Thanks, Council. It's just that uh, the Forest Fire Management Group does provide the forest expertise into the Commonwealth, and without that group, there, there would not be an avenue for it to come into the Commonwealth to provide that advice and expertise. Uh, Mr Waller, I would like to ask you about the Australasian Fire and Emergency Services Council, um, also known as AFAC. Um, what do you see um, as the respective roles of AFAC and the Forest Fire Management Group? Uh, they, they both uh, have uh, similar functions, as in the, you know, that they're, they're two streams of uh, you know, fire management. Uh, the AFAC group is largely, you know, quite a large council and uh, focuses particularly on um, very strongly on the on response side of fire fire management and uh, and community engagement and uh, that that side of it. Well, forest fire management is you know far more concentrated on land management, forest management, fire management uh, affecting forests. So that they're, um, they're and they come together because you know the the, uh, the particularly forest fire management group. Uh, obviously members of the AFAC group as well. And are all members of the Forest Fire Management Group members of AFAC and, um, or is it only part of the Forest not, Fire Management Group? It's by selection, not necessarily, but uh, generally that's the way it works out because the senior leader of, uh, you know, in forest management across Australia, you know, in any particular state or territory or in, in New Zealand is then logically slips across to become an AFAC director as well. So it, uh, it's, a, you know, it's a, a good joining together of the two organisations. Thank you. Uh, Mr Morgan, I'll ask you the same question. Uh, what do you see as the respective roles of AFAC and the Forest Fire Management Group? Well, if I go back in time, um, AFAC was originally formed back in 1993, if I'm correct, and that had each of the fire services, both paid, volunteer, um, urban and rural, and land management agencies all in together. Um, 
and that included the people in parks, forests and crown lands with fire responsibilities. So I've been a great supporter over many years for AFAC. Um, it is or was independent of government uh, and each council member having an equal voice and uh, that was really beneficial for land managers to come in and share that, share knowledge, share experiences and uh, have that good networking and professional ability and to meet through meetings and then uh, socialising through the conferences. But it is a not-for-profit, uh, limited by guarantee company. Um, so that's both good and is restrictive. So that doesn't have any uh, uh, powers to enforce whatever comes through as a position, but it does help cement uh, what could be a national position and has been able to provide a lot of support to get programs up, such as the Bushfire Company for Research Centre, um, and the National Aerial Firefighting Centre. So it can bring about significant changes. Um, and one of the significant achievements, it'd have to be uh, from a long-term member of, of AFAC right from the initial stages was uh, Sandra Lenardi, who did a lot of work on the Australasian Inter-Service Management System, or AIMS, and um, that's to be commended, and that's a highlight of AFAC. But it does appear from uh, what I've been uh, told recently that um, things are changing there and that there doesn't appear to be the same sort of level where every person there has equal vo uh, voice. And an instance is the Commissioners and Chief Fire Officer Strategic Committee, which um, is a, approximately a dozen people providing advice to EMA. And my understanding is that there is only one forest fire person on that committee. Uh, and yet uh, all the others come from uh, the other emergency services. And, and I, I think when we're particularly talking about major bushfires, which are significant emergencies in Australia, there needs to be some modification on um, and respect for the land management people with the fire expertise. And I think it's the same no matter what the situation is, what the emergency is, that you need to have respect for the people, whether it's a, a, a built environment where you have an urban fire service, whether it be a, 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 a land rural fire service coming in there from an agriculture side, or if it's in the forest, then it's the land management people. And that apparently is not having the same um, uh, way of operating as when it initially started, which I was very pleased to be involved in. I still think that it's a very good organisation, just needs some modification. That's probably about egos and people who have been appointed to roles as um, more in the, the managerial or for the non-forestry skills side rather than um, uh, for what they should be there for. Mr Morgan, are there... You mentioned sharing of knowledge um, between the Forest Fire Management Group and AFAC. Um, what mechanisms are there um, for knowledge um, to be shared between those two groups and in particular in relation to land management? Well, in, with they, they have come together quite successfully. I mentioned about the support for the bushfire uh, CRC and then the bushfire natural hazards DRC. And so they do have a lot of interactions there. And uh, without joint support and joint funding, the land managers clearly do not have the funds available that the rural and urban fire agencies have. And, and that um, being able to be part of a bigger organisation and have a lot more support does bring a lot of advantages. So there's a lot of, it's very important for land managers to be part of AFAC, but it does have a broader uh, remit and so therefore that is why the land managers looking at forest fire management is more focused and is looking at uh, more the scientific side of things and about how to deliver it and the skills and expertise and the sharing of knowledge on managing the land so that we don't have situations where we have fires like we've just experienced and that's that the slight difference but they work collectively together. Thank you. Mr Waller, do you have any comments in relation to um, knowledge sharing, in particular in relation to um, knowledge sharing um, about from the Forest Fire Management Group um, with AFAC? Uh, as Mr Morgan said, the, um, the 
the, the fire strategy that was produced by um, the Forest Fire Management Group is an excellent document and should be the you know the, the ready reference for all fire management in uh, across Australia. And unfortunately, it's not. It hasn't been picked up by the uh, you know the knowledge is there, like it often does happen, but it hasn't been picked up and used, which is really unfortunate. And um, even though it was signed off and agreed, and this is the direction we will take, it hasn't been applied as it should be applied. And hence, as uh, again, Mr. Morgan says, we the problems we had last summer are a direct result of you know, uh, poor land management or poor forest management up and down the eastern seaboard. And uh, so the knowledge sharing is uh, minimal in a lot of ways, as not that, uh, you know, that there is a clear division between the two. One, obviously, the AFAC side of it is, um, is heavily based on response and aircraft and uh, um, uh, tankers and um, uh, that type of work while uh, the Forest Fire Management Group is very big on strong la on land management. And uh, that involves burning, keeping tracks open, getting to fires quick, using aircraft quickly on uh, any outbreak. So it's, there's a degree of knowledge sharing, but it's not strong. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate. And again, as Mr Morgan said, that the, um, the land managers are often the poor cousin of the agencies who fire agencies that, who have ready access to insurance money and other monies and even donations where uh, the land managers are government departments and uh, often not well supported by, by government as in when competing, you know, competing for budget needs. So uh, it's, um, there is a divide between the two and that divide does, it, does affect um, the knowledge flow between the two, you know, between the two functions. I'd like to turn now to um, other, another aspect of sharing, which is the sharing of uh, resources for firefighting. I understand that um, land managers have their own uh, firefighting forces and brigades. Um, do those, um, how are those resources shared uh, between jurisdictions within Australia? Uh, Mr Waller? Okay. Um, obviously, when you move move between states, obviously aircraft move readily between states. Uh, you know that uh, so request goes in, and uh, NAFSI and uh, um, other organisations juggle around, and there's, there's this meeting of heads to make sure that it does you know the resources do move around. Um, it comes more formal when you're asking for resources to actually come and help, um, and you know there is a, a protocols that uh, uh, I work to. But the, the resources move readily between states as, um, you know, as needed and as requested as, um, as much as possible. Is that through um, the AFAC National Resource Sharing Centre or are there bilateral agreements between, um, between agencies? When I, when I was working there, there was uh, bilateral agreements between the states and New Zealand, particularly in America and other, you know, in other places as well. Um, but the um, the, the uh, my understanding now it's become a, through the natural resource uh, centre, which I'm, I'm not you know that came in after I left, so I can't really talk uh, in depth about it. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Morgan. Uh, the submission of the Australian Forests Institute refers to different skill sets for fire suppression: um, urban, rural, rural, and forest. Um, are you able to um, briefly explain to the Commission um, the, the different skill sets? Certainly. Um, it is it's very uh, important that people do understand that there are different skill sets. If you have a look at urban firefighters, they, they have to get to a fire very quickly um, and put wet stuff on the red stuff, if you like, pumping water out of the pumps and hydrants onto the fires using, in addition, using foams or retardants on that. Uh, likewise, when you go into a, a rural environment, um, we're very fortunate to have the volunteers that we do who have been able to bring in huge resources in a short time to virtually smother out grass fires and the likes. And they're, they're fires which are running and able to be put out by water very readily. When you go into a forest fire, the um, the fuels that you have there are different. So they're different to the what we have in buildings and they're different to the grasslands. Forest fires uh, have 
uh, not only standing trees have the shrub layer and they also have uh, the litter that's on the ground as well. And we often uh, see aircraft bombing fires and people think that that's putting the fire out. It doesn't put the fire out. It does require a lot of work on the ground to get down to mineral earth where the fire is actually stopped from moving. Otherwise, the um, fire, which is retarded, and we, we use the word retardant, and that's that red uh, material that comes out of the air tankers and onto the ground, um, and that just slows down the fire over the time. But just the hard work, which most people do not see on the ground, which is where the earthen or mineral earthen breaks are constructed to separate the fuels from the ground and so that uh, the fire doesn't burn over it. Now, the higher the, 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 the intensity of the fire, then the greater that break has to be. And that's why we often use roads and tracks and burn backs so that we have a, a bigger fire break. And in, in, in relation to the different uh, skill sets, um, how does that affect um, things such as requests for resources from interstate or overseas? OK, well, in the different skill sets, um, with the land managers, they're, they're not just dealing with the, the response phase to the firefighting. They're actually dealing with the, the all-year-round maintenance. So they're out there doing the roads and the tracks and they're, they're making sure that there are the helipads that are there. They're looking at the... The skill, they're building up the knowledge where they would be able to put in fires. They do the prescribed burning to reduce fuels. They do burning for ecological purposes and they do the high intensity burning uh, so they get a better understanding about fires and fire behaviour. All that knowledge builds up over the time so when the fire does come, whether it be from lightning or other causes, then they're able to go out there and put it out in the briefest possible time using their skills and, the, and a lot of hard work with hand tools, not water, and dozers and the likes. Um, and then afterwards, you've got to go back and do the rehabilitation and um, and then following up with maybe uh, regeneration and that. So they're, they're involved in it the whole way through. And that's, that's a particularly important aspect, whereas the others are more inclined to be uh, doing the training, the preparation, and then going into the response. So there's a bit of a difference. So when we go into state, we do need to be able to pick up people with those skill sets. And it's not just getting anybody, not any firefighter coming in. An urban firefighter with an urban tanker is going to be no good 200 kilometres away from the nearest hydrant with their equipment. They've got to be with the right equipment, the right personal protective gear and being able to perform under those arduous conditions. Thank you. Mr Waller, do you have any comments in relation to um, interstate or international requests for assistance in, in the context of uh, forest fires? Uh, very supportive of what Mr Morgan said. The, um, it, it, it was a real concern to uh, lead managers with putting people into the bush, particularly in the tall timber, uh, without those skills of knowing what what the real issues are and uh, some of the, you know, the urban or people coming from uh, flat land and whatever going into the hills was always a real concern and uh, we always tried to make sure we had leadership with them that uh, would, you know, guide them through. But when, um, and they had to control the movement of um, interstate people particularly to make sure they didn't get put, they uh, weren't put in harm's way. Uh, we we're very, very conscious of that and as Mr Morgan says it's a real skill set of being able to work safely in the bush, look after yourself and look after your mates and do effective work. And uh, it's, a, it's a concern when uh, when selecting crews, particularly to go overseas and to come from overseas, that they have that skill set that to be able to work in tall timber. I'd have to say that uh, it's this August will be 20 years since we had the first deployment of Australian New Zealanders to go to the USA. And that was only built on the trust and understanding. And it was the only reason that we could do that is because we had common systems of work. So the AIM system and also the Americans NIM system aligned very well and we were able to provide them with the skills that they required. Now that was organised through the Forest Fire Management Group. AFAC now does takes that over 
Um, but we have to be sure that we're still sending people with the right skills and ability and not just anybody from a training um, experience side of things. Otherwise, we'll be letting them down. And when they come this way, we want to make sure that when we ask for the somebody to do a task that they're able, they're capable and able to do it in a safe manner. Um, operator, if I could ask you to please bring up um, nnd.001.0065 underscore 0025. And uh, the fourth paragraph there, I think, um, Sorry, no, not that paragraph. I might have the wrong reference. I apologise. Um, it's not that reference either. I, I, I'll try and find it, but I'll ask you uh, the question in the meantime, Mr Morgan. Um, the, the submission um, of the Australian Foresters Institute uh, refers to the AIM um, training and the need for a national, national standards for accreditation and currency. I wonder if you might um, just speak to that and explain uh, the need that's identified. Okay. Um, first of all, I probably should say uh, the Institute of Foresters, um, you may not be aware um, of who the Institute of Foresters refers to, but it yes, does thank have. Yes, you. you wouldn't mind actually first just explaining um, the role of the Institute of Foresters and then we'll okay. turn to that paragraph. Okay, well, the Institute of Forests, they are an independent national body and they represent forest scientists and technicians, growers and managers with professional and practical expertise, forest pl and plantation management. Um, so they provide fire management scientific advice and development on national positions. And they have a forest fire management committee, which I'm currently the chair. And the people involved are, are many of the people who have actually appeared before this commission or other inquiries that are currently running at the moment. They include Kevin Tolhurst, Ruth Ryan, Neil Cooper, Lockie McCaw, Phil Cheney and Ewan Ferguson, all people who you well know. And both Ewan and I are members of the Institute of Foresters. Uh, and so it is a professional body, very similar to the Australian Medical Association or the CPA. And so they operate in a similar vein to that. Now, when in our submission to this Royal Commission um, on the competencies and accreditation, it's quite clear that if we don't, while we have a very good system in the AIM system, what we don't have nationally is a common standard of meeting uh, the requirements under AIMS, nor the currencies and competencies align with that to keep it running in a proper manner. And without that national um, approach, there is the possibility that while we have a great system, we'll actually have people being appointed to roles who are not competent to fulfil their roles. And so this hits the nub of um, whether it be interstate or international deployments. We need to make sure that if we're getting a, an incident controller for an incident, they're competent to do it, whether it's an operations officer or planning officer, that they can do the role that they're supposed to do under the AIM system. Thank you. I, I have identified that paragraph. Um, it's the first full paragraph on that page. Um, uh, what page are you referring to? This is... Um, uh, page 25, 24 at the bottom of the submission, um, 0025 in the uh, NUIX document ID. Um, I think you have just spoken to this paragraph, which is um, in relation to the standards under the AIMS system. Uh, Mr Waller, do you have any um, additional comments to make in relation to that? Uh, no, no. I, I, I can't see it anyway. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. Uh, commissioners, I don't have any further questions. Uh, do you have any questions for Mr Waller or Mr Morgan? No, actually that was the that very last one was one that we were quite interested in and you've covered that uh, quite well. I note looking behind Mr Morgan, he's a man that wears many hats, but uh, I appreciate him uh, with his uh, evidence today. And uh, Mr Waller, thank you and thank you for the perseverance of uh, bringing... bringing 
doing what you need to to uh, to, to come on. I think having both of you as a panel was uh, was very worthwhile. Commissioner Bennett, do you have any questions? Commissioner McIntosh? Nothing for me. No, I think uh, we've, we've got, but looking at it through a different lens that we've looked at so far, it's all bringing together a picture very nicely. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, if Mr Morgan and Mr Waller could be released from their summons. Mr Morgan, Mr Waller, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. You're released from your summons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, the next panel was scheduled to commence at 3.15. Um, we could have a, a very short adjournment um, until that time. Uh, I have 15.45. Let me just um, see whether the panel is online. The, the panel is currently online, so we They're can... They're currently online. Why don't we go straight into it? Great. Thank if you. If we can do that. Um, uh, the... The second panel this afternoon is a panel of two members of the forestry industry, um, Mr Greg Saunder and Mr Jacob Lazarus. Um, I call uh, Mr Saunder and Mr Lazarus. Good afternoon. Can you hear us? Yes, good afternoon. Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Saunder will um, be taking an affirmation. Mr. Saunder, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And Mr. Lazarus will also be taking an affirmation. Mr. Lazarus, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. I'd like to start today um, with a brief introduction um, for the commissioners of uh, who each of you are and your um, organisations. Mr Lazarus, could you please briefly introduce yourself um, to the commissioners um, and Hume Forests? Uh, yes, uh, my name is Jacob Lazarus. I'm a Kiwi forester uh, with 20 years experience. I've been uh, in the plantation industry here in Australia for 14 years. Uh, Hume Forests is, a, is the largest private plantation owner and manager in New South Wales. Uh, we have approximately 47,000 hectares of plantation under ownership and management in the uh, southeast corner of uh, New South Wales and uh, a very small amount in the northeast corner of Victoria. Thank you. And does Human Forest um, have industry fire brigades? Um, yes, we do have one in Victoria. Um, we are unable to have one in New South Wales. Could you expand on uh, what you mean by that? Uh, so in New South Wales, uh, the current legislation does not permit um, forest industry brigades to exist. However, in Victoria, uh, there is some legislation in place whereby if you own more than a certain area, 500 hectares, uh, you're legally required to set up a forest industry brigade. Uh, we um, exceed that minimum amount and therefore have set up a forest industry brigade uh, it falls under the CFA and uh, has been quite a good system to work under. Uh, it has minimum requirements for training, uh, firefighting equipment and uh, provides communication to the CFA. Uh, in New South Wales, does Hume Forest have firefighters and firefighting equipment? Uh, yes, the majority of our firefighting resource, uh, fire equipment and firefighters is based in New South Wales, uh, in the regions of the Snowy Valley and Bombala and also up in Oberon. Thank you. Uh, Mr Saunder, um, can I ask you the same question? If you could briefly introduce yourself um, and explain um, uh, what the Forest Owners Conference is. Yes, good afternoon. Yes, um, good afternoon. I'm a forester also and uh, worked in the industry for uh, just over 35 years, um, predominantly in the Green Triangle. So the Forest Owners is a collective of the forest growers, 
um, in the Green Triangle, which is, of course, the southeast of South Australia and the southwest of Victoria, so just over um, 350,000 hectares um, with the owners of the plantations in that region. So the Forest Owners Conference, or, or FOC as it's more commonly known, was formed in 1979 after the Caroline Fire, which burnt from South Australia, just southeast of Mount Gambier into Victoria. And the industry saw that there was a need to coordinate their response to fire um, better in those days. And so it's grown from there. Um, in more recent years, um, that body was not incorporated. So they fell under the Green Triangle Regional Plantation Committee to make use of their incorporation. So it's now a subcommittee of, of that body, but in a sense operates still as a standalone entity in terms of its meetings and the direction it takes. And, and what is the Green Triangle Regional Plantation Committee? So the committee was set up in 1996 um, by state and federal government uh, input along with the industry and it is again a representation of the plantation industry in the Green Triangle region and it looks at more broader issues, um, more commonly seeking funding for infrastructure such as roading and support for the industry in those ways where the Forest Owners Conference is purely to do with fire. Does the um, Do the members of the Forest Owners Conference have industry fire brigades? Uh, yes, they do. So both in South Australia and in Victoria, there is legislation to allow industry brigades to be formed. So members will quite often have uh, brigades in one or the other or both of Victoria and South Australia under those legislations. And how do those brigades op operate as private brigades within the state um, agency framework? So as such, they um, are notified of of fires that occur in their areas of interest, typically through the um, normal computer-aided dispatch systems that each of the states have. So they'll get alerts to fires that might be occurring in their area of interest, and then they'll choose to respond depending on uh, how close it is perhaps to their assets or, or other reasons. They'll then um, go to those fires but operate within the structure of either the CFS in South Australia or the CFA in Victoria using their incident management systems. And how does um, command of those industry brigades work? Um, do they operate under the direction of uh, the company or under the incident control structure of, for example, the CFA or CFS? Uh, so at all times they operate under the incident control structure, bearing in mind that, of course, being a, a form brigade, they have um, you know, a captain of the brigade and lieutenants. So, of course, if they're the first appliance or crew turning out to that brigade and that person's there, they would form um, an, an incident control structure themselves. So that person may, in fact, be the incident controller for the incident until either someone more senior comes along or there's a handover because it's a, perhaps a rural fire rather than a plantation fire. So depending on the circumstance, there'll be a discussion between the incoming expertise that's held or the fire may be sectorised to best use the skills of either plantation firefighters and rural firefighters at that time. How are questions of prioritisation determined? Um, for example, if there's a, a fire on a plantation as well as in rural land, um, who decides which fire that industry brigade will go to? In most cases, that will be done by the incident controller, but bearing in mind that uh, the industry brigades are obviously employed to protect their assets. So um, the discussion is usually held that if there is assets under threat, that um, the preference, of course, would be for the industry brigades to attend um, those plantation fires to uh, make sure that um, damage and losses are reduced to a minimum. In your experience, has there been any tension between the, the obligation to protect the private assets um, and the public role as part of the CFA or CFS? 
there will always be differing opinions. So um, certainly at times as a fire grows inside, it becomes often more difficult to push the needs of a plantation owner in terms of protection of an asset. But bearing in mind the, the hierarchy is, is still um, protection of, of, of people and, and other assets as well as plantations. So that's always thought about in the incident command structure and, and when an incident management team is formed, the, the preference is now for an advisor from the industry to attend so that there can be input from the industry into formation of incident action plans as they're developed so that the needs of protecting assets and also the best use of those crews can be made to um, help reduce the, the damage caused by the fire in, in all circumstances. And if a fire is attended um, by an industry brigade outside of a private plantation, how is that funded? Who funds their attendance at that fire? Uh, the plantation growers would fund that themselves, so there's no cross-funding back from any of the government. Roughly what proportion of fires are attended by the industry brigades um, in the plantation and outside of the plant private plantations? Uh, certainly it's a majority. I don't have a figure uh, in mind, but it's certainly more than half are attended uh, away from the assets that the industry brigades uh, are managing. And of course, um, they do that because obviously it is a part of also protecting their asset before the fires reach their asset, as well as being a good community um, responsibility to assist the rural brigades attend to fires because in the case of the plantation fires, it's a return of that effort comes back from the volunteer organisations as well. So the industry sees that it's a part of being a member of the community and attending those fires. Thank you. Mr Lazarus, um, is that similar um, to the experience of um, Hume Forests in relation to the Victorian uh, fire brigades? Um, we've had limited experience um, with the Victorian uh, model. There have been uh, relatively few fires uh, in, in the area where our brigade has been, and the fires that have been there have been uh, very, very large fires, and therefore multi-agency. In New South Wales, um, you, you touched on this briefly um, earlier in relation to um, the operation of your um, firefighters that are located in New South Wales that are not uh, formal industry brigades. Do those um, firefighters um, ever work together with the fire agencies in New South Wales? Uh, yes, they do. Um, it, it depends upon the scale of the fire. So uh, our lands, uh, private lands, so similar to those of any other private individual in New South Wales, uh, the RFS is ultimately the fire agency responsible. So in a small fire on, on our lands, uh, we will turn out and attempt to uh, extinguish and contain that fire. Um, the RFS um, may turn up. Um, sometimes if the fire is very small, they won't. Uh, in a medium scale fire, um, as the RFS turn up and our staff are on site, there will be a uh, generally a discussion on site and the command structure will be worked out there, um, generally relying upon uh, experience and local uh, relationships to see who is going to take the, uh, the various roles. In a large uh, multi-agency fire, um, we sit in a very unique situation where we're unable to uh, turn out as an industry brigade. So we have an arrangement with uh, Forestry Corporation of New South Wales where we are effectively employed uh, by them for no financial gain and we slot under themselves as an agency and our staff turn out uh, with their backing. So um, in a large, so the recent fires, the large multi-agency fires, uh, we're, we're effectively working for Forest Corps uh, in these and is that when a Section 44 declaration has been made or is that a um, is there a different system in place where that occurs? 
Uh, generally, it has uh, only occurred when there's been large Section 44 fires uh, in place, that, that particular mechanism. Mm -hmm. I'd like to now ask um, some questions in relation to the involvement of uh, private firefighters in interstate operations. Uh, Mr Lazarus, um, has the Hume um, Forests firefighters, have they been um, involved in any deployments interstate? Uh, no, no formal uh, deployments interstate, only when we've deployed uh, interstate to protect our own assets. Uh, Mr Saunders, what about um, the industry brigades from the Forestry Owners Conference? Uh, yes, certainly in the past fire season there were a number of instances of uh, brigades moving from the Green Triangle to assist with, with the fires that occurred. Um, uh, Hancock Victorian Plantations, I knew, went to Queensland to assist their sister company Hancock Queensland Plantations. Uh, 141 Plantations went to assist Forest New South Wales and also um, PF Olsen crews have responsibility for some of the plantation on Kangaroo Island, but the crews moved from the Green Triangle region, I believe, to assist with the Kangaroo Island fires as well. Were, they, um, were those uh, brigades deployed um, in any circumstances to um, national parks or... Uh, land that was not um, plantation land? I would have expected during those deployments that they would have been both within plantations and also on Crown land. Mm -hmm. So um, typically you get involved in both because of the close proximity usually of plantations to Crown land and, and national parks. So I would have expected they would have been, been involved in both circumstances. And uh, how is that assistance uh, requested? Um, it can be done in a number of ways. So sometimes it is done um, organisation to organisation and sometimes it is all, the, the assistance is also offered, um, especially if the fire risk is, is low in, in the local region and there's no need for crews. It quite often is, is offered because it is also a um, good form of training for staff to take on firefighting because you never know when your season's going to be a good season or a bad season and, and um, mm -hmm. regular training is a good thing in this respect and uh, good learnings for crews. And when there is an interstate uh, deployment, how is that funded? It could be by a number of arrangements and it would depend on each circumstance. So um, it could be self-funded by the organisation to get that experience or it could be a, a formal um, funding arrangement between the two organisations at that time. Uh, Mr Lazarus, um, I apologise if, if you did already cover this before, but I just wanted to double check. Um, when the firefighters from Hume Forest are fighting fires with um, New South Wales Forestry Corporation, how is that funded? Uh, we self-fund. Thank you. So we are not, we're not paid by Forest Corp. Mm -hmm. Um, and does the absence of the formal um, industry brigade structure um, cause um, cause any difficulties um, from Hume Forest perspective? Yeah, so uh, one of the difficulties is uh, communication. So we have, uh, through our arrangement with Forest Corp, uh, access to the Forestry Corporation uh, radio system for emergency uh matters. What we don't have access to uh, in New South Wales is the RFS uh, radio system. So when we are uh, on the fire ground here in, in New South Wales, uh, communication uh, is really with the RFS relied upon uh, using the uh, UHF radio system. This has uh, some limitations with regards to uh, topography. So uh, hills, uh, gullies, those sorts of things can can limit the range and therefore the effectiveness of uh, on-ground communication. Uh, with our Victorian uh, Forest Industry Brigade, we have access to the CFA radio network, uh, so we are able to communicate with the CFA uh, on the ground. 
Um, and do you have any um, difficulties of communication um, with um, other agencies besides the CFA? Uh, yes, so we are uh, unable to communicate with uh, a number of agencies. Um, they all run uh, separate, separate radios. Uh, the uh, recent fire season saw uh, one of our vehicles with uh, five different radio systems uh, in it, um, a DWELP one, an RFS, a CFA, a Forest Corp and a UHF mm. uh, handpiece, uh, all in one vehicle. And uh, does the presence of that many radios cause difficulties besides possible cramped spaces? Yes, um, obviously uh, the opportunity to incorrectly pick up the wrong handpiece uh, and transmit uh, the message or a message to the wrong group uh, could occur. Um, things can get very busy at a fire ground and uh, you know, it would be unfortunate for a, an important message to not be relayed to the right people by, uh, by grabbing the wrong uh, handpiece. Thank you. Uh, Mr Saunder, um, has uh, members of the Forest um, Owners Conference experienced sim similar difficulties with communication? Uh, yes, indeed. So being, um, if a brigade was uh, registered in both states, um, it's not unusual to have um, five to seven radios in a vehicle, so similar circumstances that uh, in the heat of the moment, there is certainly a possibility to either make use of the wrong radio or um, confuse messages from where they're coming. So it becomes um, yeah, certainly a risk. And when you have aerial operations as well, there might be a, a, another source of radio that you have to both monitor and um, make use of as well. Um, could you expand on that point a little bit further in relation to the aerial operations and communication there? So the aircraft usually operate on a standalone channel within uh, the fireground radio network. So in those cases, using typically a VHF band radio, you would need to have two radios in a vehicle to communicate if you were the incident controller, for instance, one with your fire ground sector commanders or crews and one with the aircraft to determine where the drops were required. And so it, just in that instance, without complicating the, um, you know, back to your um, hierarchy, um, there's that confusion of using the same sets of radios for communication and you would need to have at least two radios running at all times in that circumstance. In relation to um, the aerial assets at at the border, um, how does, um, sorry, take one step back, do the, uh, do the members of the owners conference um, have any aerial assets themselves? Uh, there's one member that operates a helicopter as an observation platform on uh, the bad days, um, but beyond that, there is no fire bombing or that type of capacity within the group currently. Okay. Thank you. Um, you mentioned before that uh, a brigade may be registered both with the um, CFA and the CFS. What are the requirements in terms of uh, training and qualifications to be able to achieve that? So you need to meet the requirements in both states. So typically um, for plantation firefighters, the aim is to have a plantation firefighter um, certification. So that uh, requires having basic firefighter as well as the plantation firefighter. And so therefore, Currently, there's uh, courses run in both states. Um, unfortunately, there are some subtle differences between the two, so it usually requires either to do the courses in both states, which is a fair impost on the industry, and also uh, from time to time do bridging courses if you've done it in one state and need to move to another or, or register with another. Um, the process of also exchanging training 
certificates that are held in one state to the other is often quite, um, well, it's not seamless, so it becomes more difficult. So the industry would certainly like to see a national standard for base, both basic and plantation firefighter, and that would also assist with the um, interstate deployments. Um, when, when staff are sent, you could also quickly provide their certification to another state, which hopefully would be readily recognised and understood in that state. Thank you. Mr Lazarus, um, is that similar to your um, experience in relation to training and qualifications? Uh, yes, very similar. We have uh, obviously our CFA uh, training to meet uh, minimum requirements there. Uh, however, the uh, to achieve the same qualifications, so a basic firefighter, the uh, units required in uh, New South Wales to meet an RFS a firefighter, for example, are different. Uh, so we've elected to be trained in uh, both. So we hold a, uh, a Victorian and a New South Wales basic firefighter, for example. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions? Um, I actually think we've got a few questions. Uh, we've, we've been slowly exploring the issues of interoperability over the, well, the last few months. But Mr Lazarus, you guys win, <laughs> I think, uh, with the, the level of difficulty that's there. Can I just ask a question? Your firefighters go across the Murray River and they're a member of the CFA, so they fight under a CFA construct. <laughs> but if there's a fire on the New South Wales side, they, they'll they jump the river, fight that fire, but if you go outside the plantation, you're coming under a commercial MOU or agreement with the state forestry, is that right? Uh, effectively, and the thing that puzzles us the most is the fire is the same on both sides of the border. No, we're uh, puzzled so by the same seen... thing, so don't don't feel too puzzled. That's OK. And, and I won't yes, even go... So... I, I think you've covered the interoperability uh, challenges that that, that poses. Um, Commissioner, yeah. Commissioner Bennett, I think, has got a question as well. Yes, I must say, Mr Lazarus, I also have been quite intrigued by, um, by your story, if I may say so. Um, so just to clarify a couple of things, are your properties on, on, in, in um, uh, Victoria and New South Wales contiguous? Uh, no, they're not. They're not, OK. But you've got a situation where... Um, you get information in, in Victoria where you're a brigade, you get information by that reason from the CFA. In New South Wales, you don't get any particular information from the RFS other than what you can glean from, I suppose, fires near me and the radio that you referred to. But basically, you're not getting any special information in New South Wales. Is that right? Uh, no, it's not. Um, so uh, through our arrangement with Forest Corp, uh, the uh, very ingrained Forest Corp uh, surveillance method. Uh, they have fire towers up. They are, are very, very efficient. And uh, we have an arrangement with Forest Corp where they uh, provide us with uh, the details and location of any fire that is uh, spotted or observed uh, in or adjacent to our plantation. OK, so that... Uh, so we can... Uh, Deal with yeah, it. So we can respond. Okay. So that comes that, that comes to the corporation or to the firefighting unit? Uh, so it comes from Forestry Corporation to our uh, duty forester if they're not available uh, to to one of the other foresters. So we're aware of it. Uh, it goes over the uh, radio system, and our firefighters listen to that through the through the summer. And uh, the moment they hear of a fire, um, it's, uh, they, they start responding uh, very, very quickly. And so I've just got a couple of other little questions. So can you send your firefighters from Victoria to New South Wales, from New South Wales to Victoria, your own firefighters? Uh, yes, we can. Um, and we do because they're the same, they're effectively the same people. Uh, in the border region where we operate, uh, we have forests very close to each other over the border, um, within two or three kilometres of each other. I see. When I said so, that when, you, when I, you said they're not contiguous, they're actually not really separated by more than a kilometre or two. Is that right? Uh, correct. Uh, we have a spread uh, in the Snowy Valleys um, of about 100 kilometres, 
Uh, and in the Bombala region, it's it's probably closer to 45 to 50 kilometres in terms of uh, from our northern to most southern plantations. But they're not a contiguous okay. Uh, okay. land ownership structure. So is, are there any, um, any inhibitions or any difficulties at all um, with regard to your to your ability to fight fires in Victoria and New South Wales in terms of the actual firefighting. I'm not talking about um, radios at the moment, but in terms of sending, having people cross the border and fi fight the fires on both sides of the border, are there any difficulties in, the, in manpower or person power, if I can call it that, man in the gender neutral sense? Um, no, so our uh, team members, both uh, male and female, uh, fight fires uh, on both sides of the border. Um, the the limitations come down to being able to communicate with the right people now that we have uh, these structures uh, in place. And a, a lot of these structures are, are built upon strong and long relationships between uh, here in New South Wales, between ourselves and Forest Corp. And the CFA relationship is a uh, relatively new one for us in uh, forestry circles, being uh, approximately seven years, I believe. Do each of those men and women have to be trained and accredited, if I can call it that, both in New South Wales and Victoria then? Uh, yes, we understand they do, and we do do that to ensure that we don't have a an issue where someone that uh, unfortunately gets injured in Victoria but are only New South Wales trained, we, we wouldn't want that. So uh, we, we train in both states. Okay, and there was one other thing that you said that I, I have to I have to ask you about. I must say, you said that um, uh, when they uh, come uh, that a command when they come onto your property in New South Wales, a command structure will be worked out. Yes, so how does that, um, we how have does that some, actually happen? Uh, so we have some very experienced uh, staff, very very far experienced staff, and uh, a lot of these staff um, will have grown up with. Uh, some of the RFS members that turn up. Um, these relationships are long. They may have gone to school together. Uh, they'll be familiar with each other's uh, firefighting uh, experiences and uh, they will stand there and work out who is going to handle which part of the situation, uh, be it heavy plant or a sector or, or something along those lines. And uh, they, will, they will determine that for themselves on the ground. Uh, the RFS have ultimate control. So if there's, uh, if there's a disagreement, uh, ultimately the RFS have that, uh, that call. OK, thank you very much. Very interesting. Commissioner McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, Mr Saunder, for your, for your evidence. Unfortunately, I'm going to go to Mr Lazarus again, so I just want to say thank you and don't, don't think we didn't appreciate your evidence. Um, Mr Lazarus, you said that when there's major fires, your staff come under the Forestry Corporation. And I'm just trying to understand does that mean that they're covered by the Forestry Corporation's insurance and workers' compensation arrangements, or are you, is your company still on the line for those sorts of things? Uh, it would depend upon the land tenure, uh, is our understanding. Uh, so on our land, uh, ours covers it, but our understanding is that uh, when we are off our patch and in another area working underneath the, uh, that arrangement, it's covered by Forest Corp. Right, so you effect, they effectively become part of the Forestry Corporation? Yes, yeah, so they're, they, they're taking the risk. They shouldn't have to, yep. uh, but they are taking that risk. Great. Can I just pull up, um, operator, can I pull up? Oh, it's not tended. Oh, is it? Oh. Um, in your submission, then, um, Mr Lazarus, you, uh, you raise issues about um, the desire to be incorporated into the New South Wales RFS structure so that you get similar protections that they have. I assume that you're talking there of uh, Section 128 of the Rural Fires Act, which basically says that uh, a person who's acting in good faith in conducting um, fire activity for the RFS or a similar organisation um, can't be held liable for for any damages. I assume that's the protection you're after? Correct. Correct. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Chair, nothing else for me. No, thank you. And, and just to go back to the liability question again, Mr Lazarus, you, if you're fighting on forest court land, obviously there's your understanding is your firefighters are protected, but if you were to step off that land 
onto another piece of land to protect, help protect that, you may or may not, they may or may not have protections. Is that right? Um, Forest Corp as an agency uh, have a jurisdiction that goes beyond their boundary. Okay. Um, so uh, it would depend upon exactly where. Um, and it would also depend on the size and the scale of the fire. Okay. So well, it makes it very hard for your firefighters, I'm sure, and as they're reaching the boundaries, to to have to monitor that while they're trying to fight a, a fire, especially the uh, the intensity of the last uh, last season. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Commissioner Bennett's got one more question. Sorry, I just have one small question. I, you may have said it, Mr Saunder, I just want to clarify it. On the training issue, because you're South Australia and Victoria, I th did you say that um, each of your men and women firefighters have to uh, get qualified for both? Just to clarify that. Um, so, yes, in the circumstances where they have uh, an organisation had registered brigades in both states, yes, there would be a need to meet the requirements of both states. If they want, especially if you want to move them between the two states? Yes, all the organisations don't have the luxury of having multiple brigades, so they usually um, use the same people on both sides of the border. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Yeah. Ms. Beast, that's the end of our questioning. Is that, are you complete uh, as well? Yes. Yeah. Gentlemen, can I, uh, on behalf of the Commission, thank you for really giving us a good understanding of the interoperability issues that you uh, that you face while you're, you're fighting these fires and the differences across states. It's helped us uh, get a better understanding, a far better understanding of uh, some different issues that we weren't aware of until we uh, we got to this session. But we appreciate uh, you taking the time this afternoon very much and I uh, want to thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. If uh, Mr Saunders and Mr Lazarus could be released from their summons. Mr Saunders and Mr Lazarus, thank you again and, uh, and you're released from your summons. We appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Commissioners, that concludes the evidence for today. Um, we might adjourn until tomorrow morning. Let's adjourn until tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock Canberra time. Thank you. All right. Commission has adjourned until 10am tomorrow.